It's really important to understand that when we talk about anxiety, I want to talk about it at a scientific level, but before I get into that, I think something that we always miss when we talk about mental health conditions is the emotions behind it. So the planning pays off and it actually reinforces. So it's a positive reinforcement of the excessive planning. What happens when you have co-occurring social anxiety and lack of social ability? Here's the key thing. Don't let the social anxiety trick you into thinking that you are worse than you are. It's lying. And it was like, I would be in a conversation and it was like, in the conversation, I would look out into the world and I just saw mirrors. I think anxious people, if they work through their anxiety, become some of the most brave people on the planet. I don't know if it's better to say you should feel less. What we should actually be saying is, how do we get you to be more brave? I promise you that if you have a high level of anxiety, you are braver than you know you are. Who here has social anxiety? <laughs> Uh, so I'm talking about it. We're going to talk about it at a clinical level, but also we can just talk about it at a, um, an emotional level, essentially. Um, I like talking about social anxiety. So for your guys' background, for me with social anxiety, I both had basically diagnosable social anxiety. I was working with a psychologist at the time who erred away from diagnosis in general, which is totally fine. Um, but I basically hit the clinical threshold kind of across the board. I had social anxiety in multiple different environments as well. So it really affected me in peer to peer interactions. And it was, that was kind of the most, um, where it affected me was peer to peer interactions. So as you can imagine, work, school, kind of everything as a young adult, that's almost everything. Um, the only areas where it wasn't an issue is if there was a clear power dynamic at play, it felt like I knew the social script. So if I was talking with an authority, I was actually pretty good. Or if I was an authority of somebody else, I, I was comfortable. Also weird thing during my social anxiety, I still really enjoyed public speaking, which a lot of, um, a lot of social anxiety will be, there's a specifier called public speaking like it's a specifier of public speaking social anxiety. I had distinctly didn't have that one. Where's the line, line drawn on anxieties and social anxieties? Great question. That's where we're gonna actually start. Let's talk about anxiety first. So anxiety is, as you guys know, it's an emotion. It's like, um, I heard a psychoanalytic uh, therapist by the name of Jonathan Shedler, uh, DC, thank you. Um, he does a video where he talks actually about anxiety and depression being like fevers of mental illness, where they're more so markers and symptomology of something being wrong, but they're not exactly like clear, like diagnostically clear things as to what's going wrong. So it's really important to understand that when we talk about anxiety, I want to talk about it at a scientific level. But before I get into that, I think something that we always miss when we talk about mental health conditions is the emotions behind it, right? For a lot of people, anxiety is a deeply lived experience. And so I wanted to show you how artists conveyed that lived experience. So I looked up a bunch of artwork done by a bunch of people on Pinterest to convey anxiety. Um, and so some of this is social anxiety focused, as you'll kind of notice, and some is just anxiety. But I think it's really important to remember the human aspect of anxiety, which is suffering. It is distress. Uh, it is being uncomfortable in your own skin, never feeling at peace, constantly feeling like this gas on running from sensation. Not a running to, not a goal-oriented behavior, but a running from. Uh, it can be crippling. So as you can kind of tell from the images that I've shown here, it's not always cute. It's not romantic. It is the experience of extreme derision and upset with no clear answer forward. Um, it is 
being lost in a fog and feeling like you're holding an entire plane of ice together and you can hear it cracking and popping and you've got like these tiny threads attached to your fingers and you know that if you move too fast or too quickly that everything's going to blow and you're going to sink. But you can't just stay still either. It is this pressure on your chest like something is crushing you and it never leaves. It's this hand that is like sealed around your heart that makes it feel like there's less space for you to like just ex have, a, or have a, a pulse within you. This is not AI art, no. So let's talk about anxiety. Let's talk about anxiety. Um, will these slides be available for free? I'm not sure. I haven't decided on that. Possibly. Though this at least will be converted into a free YouTube video, so kind of. So let's talk about anxiety. So we've got the bodily experience, the mind, and the actions, basically. So I'm going to break it into body first. So excuse the why. Um, anxiety at a body level, the somatic level, is heart racing and muscle tension and headaches and stomach aches and sleep disturbances and teeth grinding. You can get fatigued really easily. Sometimes anxiety will express in facial twitches. Um, if you've ever seen Encanto, uh, Surface Pressure. Surface Pressure is a really good song about like anxiety caused by kind of perfectionism and, and external pressure. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard it, but she has that chorus where she goes, pressure like a tick, 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 it'll never stop. That tick, tick, tick. If you've experienced a large amount of anxiety, feels whew, big. Bod E. Thank you, Rob Dylan. <laughs> awesome job. Right? So we have to remember that mental health doesn't occur just within the brain. Uh, it doesn't occur just within the amorphous psychology. It's a psychosomatic Psycho, it's a psychosomatic experience. Um, it's why we use the biopsychosocial model uh, a lot of times in trying to interpret and understand psychology. I'm telling you, Rob, how dare you? All right, it also affects the mind. So symptoms of anxiety at the mind level can look like irritability. Um, this is especially going to be common. We see irritability a little bit more in men. Um, just in general, when men are experiencing particularly negative emotional distress, a way that they often express it is through irritability. Um, but obviously there are women, everyone in between can experience irritability. Um, but anxiety can cause somebody to become really irritable. It's kind of like, it feels like there's like something scratching in your brain, like all the time. It can also cause things like difficulty concentrating, um, which is why actually a lot of people who, so there's a lot of people, for example, who grew up their whole life and are successful in school. Um, hashtag, I'm going to tell you the story of me. They grew up their entire life um, being really successful at school. They're kind of the golden child. Um, they try really hard. They work really hard in part because it's like kind of pressured on them like that they need to. Um, and then in their like 20s, they kind of hit like this crashing point where they don't have energy anymore. They're super exhausted um, and they're kind of like tapping out on life a little bit. And they begin to experience some symptoms like difficulty concentrating. And a lot of these people will later go on to get diagnosed with AD adult ADHD. The issue is that anxiety can actually cause concentration and attentional issues similar to ADHD. It's just that treatment's really different, right? In the case of ADHD, we're talking about somebody who has a different brain, like their brain has less capacity for basically like executive functioning and kind of like impulse control at a really simple level. So their brains reigns. The, the brakes are uh, weakened. Uh, in the case of anxiety, though, the brain's brakes are weakened not because the brakes are dysfunctional, There's but because they are, type of eel. their tires are always spinning Dot. out too fast, so they've worn down the brakes a little bit. But the brakes can be mended with a bit of time. Selkopa, thank you for the sub. Appreciate that. So um, when it comes to something like anxiety um, versus ADHD, the line isn't super clear. Um, to some degree, I always prefer exploring if there is a 
anxiety disorder first, in my view, would be the priority because anxiety disorders are treatable in a way that ADHD isn't treatable. ADHD is manageable, manageable, right? So you don't cure ADHD, you manage it. Whereas with anxiety, you can actually treat it. You can get it to the point where the anxiety goes away. And I know this personally, I went to therapy, I got treatment for social anxiety, and I did that for a couple of years, and I don't have social anxiety anymore, like almost ever. And when social anxiety pops up in me, I have all the tools and skills that I learned in therapy, and by practicing it outside of therapy, that I can manage my social anxiety really well, and it doesn't really control me anymore. Okay, excessive worrying is going to be the most standard form of anxiety that we think of when we're talking about anxiety. Um, so that's going to be, um, I'm trying to think of a good example of like what this looks like, because all these diagnostic words are vague, right? Like what does excessive mean? Um, so um, excessive is kind of the key word, difficulty controlling the worry. All of this is... Um, it's, it's all normative language. It's essentially saying you have excessive worrying that seems beyond the scope of what the situation is and what most people would feel but based on that situation, right? So most people, when they're going to a party and they're 21 and they don't know anyone at the house party is going to be pretty socially anxious. They're going to be nervous because social anxiety is the fear of others judging you based on your social performance, right? So it's not a fear of social interactions in and of themselves because most socially anxious people do just fine with people that they're close with. It's specifically the fear of negative judgment based on the social interactions. That's the key piece. So anxiety is always a fear that is excessive about an event, right? So if I am going into a um, MMA fight circle and I know that I have a TBI and I've had six concussions and I don't want to go into it. I'm being forced to because the Yakuza are like withholding my child or some crazy shit, right? I'm going to feel massive amounts of anxiety and worry as I step into the ring, but nobody would say that that's excessive because it's high stakes. I don't want to do it. And I have a high risk of dying if I get another brain injury, right? So nobody would say that it's excessive if I'm super, super anxious. But if I'm, for example, going to a house party and yeah, there's about 10 people I don't know, but there's about six people that I do and I'm super anxious to the point that I can't even talk to strangers and I'm 21, we would say that that's probably an excessive level of worrying. Um, so I know these words are annoying because they're all like, unclear it's because it's normative language it's is it beyond what we think would be reasonable given the culture the space and your exposure and experiences um which is why a single self-report for diagnosis is terrible <laughs> um if you're watching on twitch just a heads up i'm about to run an ad if you would like to get ad free watching i'm going to give you like 10 seconds to get a prime or a sub in before. So 10 seconds, get your primer subs. If you can't, if you were generous enough, maybe you can donate to a poor soul who doesn't have a sub. 10, nine, eight, oh, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Add. Okay. So another way that this worrying could express okay. Um, so yeah, rehearsing. Somebody in the chat mentioned rehearsing. Rehearsing is a really common way that I find anxiety expresses itself uh, kind of at a mind level, which is you're constantly thinking about things. So especially if you're rehearsing beforehand, so in the case of social anxiety, you're refer rehearsing beforehand, what you're going to say, There's how you're going to interact, and then even worse is after but. the social interactions, when you're beating yourself up and stressing and worrying, you're replaying all of your social interactions, how you failed and how you could have been a more charismatic giga chad, but you weren't, right? And you're like analyzing like oh when i smiled did i like i felt a little bit of like spit like pop on my lip i wonder if they noticed that and like thought it was weird so it's the rehearsing beforehand and then the ruminating afterwards as well so in most anxiety disorders excluding one there is a worry about a very specific thing so most anxiety disorders that are in the dsm-5 are some spe specified anxiety so in the case of like a phobia a phobia is a Ex extreme fearful anxious response to a, a, a specific thing like a dog's or 
spiders, whatever, heights, right? Those are phobias. Social anxiety disorder in the DSM-5 is a excessive worry and fear around the judgment in social interactions, right? So most anxiety disorders are about a specific thing except for generalized anxiety disorder. GAD, GAD, uh, generalized anxiety disorder is kind of a pervasive, so it's usually more mild anxiety across the board, but it's super generalized, right? So a socially anxious person is only going to be anxious in those social interactions that like trigger their anxiety. Whereas somebody with GAD is going to be probably similarly, they're going to have some social anxiety. They're going to have some, they're just always worrying all the time. So it's like, sometimes it's not, although there are mild, moderate and severe forms. So there are severe forms of GAD where they're worrying about everything all the time to an extreme degree. Um, but that's how you kind of dis differentiate the different diagnoses. And then obviously there's specifiers within each of these diagnoses. Like I said, social anxiety disorder has the specifier of public speaking, for example. So for one example would be if I uh, have almost no social anxiety, but public speaking makes me so sick to my stomach that I like am willing to fail courses and it like damages, like uh, imagine I'm in some way in a profession where public speaking would be required. Like in this, you know, if I suddenly got really intense fear about like public speaking on stream, obviously that might be a specifier where I'm diagnosed with social anxiety disorder with the specifier of public speaking. So I don't have general social anxiety just in, in public speaking. Excessive planning and preparing. Um, one of the like most common things that comes to mind of this is I remember um, I had a client who had some pretty bad uh, generalized anxiety disorder and they were just like the most overprepared human, right? Like we would go out, um, they're going to be the person where if you like go to the concert, they didn't just bring like maybe one Tylenol, which is like forethought they brought an entire thing full of Tylenol because what if not only they needed Tylenol but you needed Tylenol and they had to do that handing out of Tylenol five to seven times and they forget to restock their Tylenol so they have a whole giant thing of Tylenol in their purse in case not only they need Tylenol but they forget to restock their Tylenol 10 to 15 times in a row and then one day seven months of the future they go to get a Tylenol and they're out right that's the excessive part is it's like yeah bringing Tylenol to a concert is reasonable having some Tylenol stored in your bag is reasonable having a large amount of Tylenol for the fear that in seven months from now you might forget your Tylenol seems a little bit excessive right that's the excessive planning and preparing it's like you're not just planning and preparing for like the worst possible outcome, but it's like more than that. And this is actually kind of this metacognitive loop that a lot of anxious people can get into. So I'm going to draw this out because I don't think I have a specific slide on the metacognitive loop that I want to talk about here. But a lot of times with anxiety, what we'll see is... So let's just call it excessive planning for now, just for simplicity. So they'll do a whole bunch of excessive planning to prevent some negative outcome, right? However, shit There's happens. only one type of eel. And their planning okay. pays off. Dot. Right? They packed two extra pairs of sandals and that day it happened to be the case that not only did they lose their sandal, but somebody else did as well, right? They broke a sandal, a flip-flop at the beach or something. So like, oh man, I'm so, I was so smart. I'm so glad that I planned that extra thing because now we had it. So the planning pays off and it actually reinforces... So it's a positive reinforcement of the excessive planning. And so it loops. And so this is the issue is that if you excessively plan, while you're not going to notice all of the times we're bringing two extra pairs of sandals to the beach didn't pay off, you'll just remember the one time that it did pay off. And because it did pay off once, that'll reinforce to you that your excessive amount of planning and preparing is necessary, right? So, um, I can speak about this more openly. Uh, my mother-in-law has some pretty intense anxiety. I'm not diagnosing her by any means, but she is always excessively planning and preparing and it pays off like less than 10% of the time. But when we try to be like, can you stop like over, can you just chill and stop over preparing? Like we don't need all this stuff, just chill. They'll be like, yeah, but remember that one time it paid off? And they're like, yeah, but remember all of the other nine times that it didn't? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> but it did pay off once, so reinforcement and you're like ah so this is kind of like one of the metacognitive loops is 
And this excessive planning can also just be like mental planning, right? So you'll be like, I'm going to plan for the worst possible outcomes. It feels reinforcing to have that type of worrying thoughts because it pays off like 10% of the time. And you're like, but I was prepared for this unexpected thing because I was worrying about it beforehand. And so this is actually the loop of thoughts that you can get into with, um, anxiety where basically you excessively plan or you i could throw in here slash worry slash prepare planning pays off like 10 percent of the time however the 10 percent is reinforcing enough that it motivates you to continue to worry and whatnot so this can be one of the biggest issues for a lot of like people with especially like generalized anxiety is getting out of this like metacognitive loop where they come to like their own worrying thoughts because even though they know that their worrying thoughts are ruining their life in a lot of ways it pays off enough of the time that it motivates them to keep doing it so this is one of the really tricky things with anxiety is that it's oftentimes somewhat self-reinforcing and it can make it really tricky to break some of these like obsessive worrying thoughts um yeah stinkfist thank you again for the gifted subs very generous okay actions so another way that anxiety will express itself is in the actions of somebody so this you have to be careful with right this is where <laughs> they the empaths try to look at just this and they're like oh you're pretty jumpy that must mean that you're a very anxious person and it's like well not always <laughs> like, like chill okay so these are some bodily cues for example that like a therapist or a practitioner might use to cue them that anxiety is going on particularly in the case of like if you're doing individual therapy a lot of the goal of therapy is to basically walk people along emotionally, bring them down into like emotions that they don't like, that they want to avoid so that they can process them because we spend most of our time avoiding negative emotions. So we bring them down into a space that they're uncomfortable, it's distressing, and you let them work on it a little bit and then you bring them back up and level out. However, as you're bringing them down, you're wanting to watch for like vi physical cues and also asking for verbal cues to make sure that you're not bringing them down so far that it like distresses them or even like to some in like extreme cases like in the case of trauma re-traumatizes them right so you bring them down and then back up but not so far down that they don't that they aren't willing to trust you to bring them down and back up again right is this medical advice no it's just education i do have sources for everything though so um like 40 so if you want to look through all that shit, have at her. So some cues, some physical cues of anxiety could be things like being jumpy or kind of hypervigilance. Um, avoiding situations that provoke fear is going to be one of the biggest markers of anxiety. And again, um, if we're talking about the self-reinforcing loop, like we did here, the planning pays off. Another really bad loop is avoidance. So this is why we say that if you have anxiety, you cannot avoid. I don't want you to have a safe space. You must confront the thing, right? Avoidance, we're not entirely sure how, but basically avoidance, well, we, we kind of do know how. You avoid, which relieves your stress temporarily. It also, there's some models that basically argue that it also essentially reinforces the fear which usually makes the fear grow, which makes you avoid more. <laughs> so anxiety, you're, what you guys are gonna start to see is a lot of mental health problems because I, I have a couple of talks pre prepared, one on social anxiety specifically, anxiety and depression. A lot of these mental health um, symptoms basically create self-reinforcing cycles. And so treating these things can be, they're decently effective, but also very distressing for an individual because basically you have to break this. So the best way to break this pattern is, well, we don't want to do this because we don't want to like have somebody feel temporary relief from avoiding and then like cause them like, yeah, basically not give them the actual like release. So this is the issue with anxiety is there's 
the reinforcing loop of the metacognitions, and there's a reinforcing loop of the behaviors themselves. So in the case of anxiety, you're going to avoid situations that provoke fear, right? So a highly socially anxious person is probably not like running to go to a whole bunch of like house parties where they know no one, right? They're more likely to be like invited and bail at the last minute because their anxiety gets too great. And here's the trick, right? So you're the socially anxious person. You've got a party planned. You committed to going with your friend, but your friend is the only person you know. And then an hour before you're feeling sick, you're just like everything in your soul is like, God, I don't want to go. Everything in you is like, I don't want to go. I don't want to fucking go. And then you cancel last minute on your friend. You're like, I'm sorry. I'm just feeling really sick, which isn't a lie. You are feeling sick. You're not sick, but you are feeling sick. Um, and your friend's like, no worries. I'm kind of tired tonight too. Let's just catch something later, right? And your immediate response is, yes, right? Fucking yes. Okay, that immediate relief is understandable. It's very human and it's reinforcing the social anxiety, unfortunately. So uh, other ways that it can express would be obviously breaking eye contact. However, we also have certain um, kind of social uh, related disorders like uh, autism can cause issues where people have a hard time with eye contact as well. Um, and it's not clear whether that's from anxiety or other things. Um, because there's kind of some eye tracking and that they in general have a hard time attending to eyes. Um, it can cause procrastination. It can cause perfectionism. Um, you're unable to sit still. You're snapping at others. Um, you could be super fidgety, right? Kind of the obvious sides. I mean, we kind of know culturally what to look for in anxiety, right? Like the person who's like this is anxious, most likely, right? They might have to shit really bad. It might be, it might not be anxiety, but most of us are gonna read that as anxiety. <laughs> yeah, that moment where you get off the hook feels insanely good. Absolutely. The problem is that it's reinforcing the anxiety. Okay. So what is anxiety? Anxiety is anticipation of future threat, right? So if you guys know what this is from, this is from Stranger Things. Um, I think that this image is a great example of what anxiety feels like, at least for me. Anxiety feels like when you close your eyes, you can see the monster off in the clouds. You don't know when it's going to hit. You don't know why or how or what it's going to look like, but shit's going to hit the fan. It's going to be bad and you want to put it off for as long as possible. Dread. Yes. So it's really important to understand because fear and anxiety are not precisely the same thing for the most part. There's different types, like I mentioned, there's generalized anxiety disorder. There is specific, so things like phobia. Apparently there's a type of thing called egg phobia. This guy has eggs and it's scaring her. I used to fear the fear, the fear, the phobophobia, being afraid of being afraid, yeah. And then social phobia, which is, or social anxiety disorder. Uh, it was previously in the past called social phobia disorder as well. There's also something called agoraphobia. Agoraphobia is a type of phobia. It's a fear of basically leaving your house. It's a couple of different types of fears lumped into one. So it could be a fear of leaving your house. It could be a fear of open spaces or public spaces. Um, it could be a fear of observation or a fear of being in a public space that you cannot escape from. Um, a lot of people with agoraphobia have a mixture of all of these fears, but some people will have only one or two of them. Some people are afraid of being in lines, stuff like that. Um, but it's in general about being in a public space or away from your domicile, like your home. Okay. So as I, I talked about, we have the avoidance trap. Um, I've already talked about this, so I'll cover, cover it. So let's talk about the myth of normal. Um, I want to bring this up because this is always an important, it's an important thing to remember in all this. So when we're looking at things like a diagnosis or a mental health disorder, we have to remember that almost all mental health behavior is occurring along a spectrum, right? So it's not like there's this trigger where magically one day you're not anxious and now you have an anxiety disorder and there's like no space in between that. It's just like you like wake up. I mean, that can literally happen, but most people experience most things, especially mental health stuff along a spectrum of experience, right? With some people being at the extreme end of experiencing almost no anxiety most of the time, most people having some feelings of anxiety some of the time. And then when we're getting towards that end of the other end of the spectrum where we're having 
lots of anxiety almost all the time. There's basically, fundamentally, it's not fully arbitrary. There's a statistical reasoning as to why we draw the line along one point of symptomology and not further back or more conservative. But we draw a line at some point and we say, symptomology over this line is now a diagnosis and symptomology behind this line is just considered subclinical experiences, right? But this is where um, Eric Fromm and other kind of uh, psychiatrists, um, even the neurodivergence uh, literature in general, kind of has this argument about the myth of normal, which is the argument that basically like, there's no such thing as normal. Everything about like excessive is all normative base. And the question is, what, what is normal? Normal is a statistical finding. Normal doesn't truly exist. There is no person who is going to have precisely 2.5 children in America, right? Um, it's a statistical average of a conglomerate but that means then that normatives are harder to apply to an individual so this is why i brought up that anxiety that is proportionate to the event that you're experiencing right so if you're pretty anxious because there's a final coming up and it's worth 30 percent of your grade and you're not feeling good about it and you don't have time to study and you're burnt out it's decently understandable to be anxious about it right this is why I, I offer a lot of critiques, for example, against something like university, because I think university is a necessary recipe for anxiety disorders. Um, you know, when all these students are complaining about attention and concentration issues, I'm not shocked. I mean, it's a breeding place for anxiety. It's, 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 it's not disproportionate, in my view, to be anxious about a two-hour experience that determines 30% of your grade. Like, of course that's anxiety-provoking. It should be, and it's at the end of a semester when you're fucking exhausted. Um, and bearing in mind, you're, it's, always that, it's always the class that's the worst to study for that is on the same day as some other dumbass class that you like didn't pay a close enough attention to. So you've got to study for both, and they're on the same day, and by the time you're ready for the second, you're so tired. Yeah. So I put this in here to basically say the myth of normal is about the subclinical experience, which is to say when somebody, for example, this is why the self ID stuff is tricky because if you self ID symptomology, like I'm experiencing feelings of social anxiety, I think that that's not just reasonable. I think it's good to do. I think it's really good to identify your symptoms. The issue is that you shouldn't diagnose yourself with a disorder or because it's this line, this threshold that I would argue only professionals should really be crossing over because there's a specific purpose behind the diagnostic label that is even being argued. But everyone will experience feelings of social anxiety. Everyone will experience feelings of depression. Everyone will experience feelings of anxiety, like broad general anxiety. That's really normal. The question that we're looking for as far as like, do I need treatment? Do I need professional support is, is my anxiety disproportionate to events consistently and is it also causing dysfunction in my life, right? Is it ruining my life as a result? And if you're like, well, it's not really ruining my life because I just never have to leave the house. I would be like, well, if you wanted to leave the house, could you? And if your answer was no, I would say, that's definitely worth looking into because it's like, you might be missing out on things that you've just decided to not value anymore. Joanna, you could be wrong about your own diagnosis as well. So the question of like, when do you refer, this is kind of what I answered before. Um, so this isn't when to refer somebody else. This is for yourself. Like when should you go be seeing professional help? When you, when should you go to therapy? I would argue you can go to therapy at any point in time. Um, I don't know if there's a specific point where it's like, you must go to therapy. I think in general, most people could benefit from some elements of therapy, even just to get some of the psychoeducational tools to know like, how to emotionally regulate stuff like that when i would say you're at a point where it's like you should really strongly be considering seeking a professional is if like i said again if your anxiety is chipping into your life in a way where it's like causing you to lose relationships it's causing it's affecting your work it's affecting your education to an extreme degree um or if it's just causing your own life to just become miserable. Um, anxiety is quite treatable, especially with therapy. It's got a pretty high effic uh, efficacy rate, which just means like effectiveness at, well, not effectiveness precisely, because effectiveness and efficacy are technically different. It's basically, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. Efficacy is essentially the degree to which something treats a precise thing well. 
How can you get a therapist? I don't believe you need a doctor to refer you to a therapist. A lot of therapists have private practice and take insurance. So most people can get a therapist just by calling a psychologist or a therapist in their area and seeing if they take it. Um, I do have a video on YouTube called how to find a therapist. I believe there's a number of videos I found as well uh, from other content creators that also talk about how to find a therapist and how to interview them and stuff. Just look at all of those. Um, to kind of get an idea of what a bunch of different people recommend to get an idea of what you're looking for. There is a bit of a like, uh, how do you say it? Is it buyer beware essentially. Um, there is a bit of like, unfortunately, like some level of vetting you have to do on your own for therapy. Um, but therapists do try to make it, good therapists will try to make it as easy as possible. If you tell them what you're looking for, they can let you know if that's something that they're specialized in they work with, okay? Um, finally, if there's some sort of like compulsive anxiety going on, so say for example, um, you're constantly feeling like, an, like it's not just like an urge to do something, but it's like, it's like if you don't do it, there will be problems. Like you must do this thing. And their behavior, the things that you're feeling compelled to do, when you think about it logically, don't make a lot of sense, right? So if it's like, I need to go check that my house is locked for the eighth time, right? Um, I know that I turned off the stove, but I'm panicking. I like want to go turn off the stove. I want to check every lock. You know, I need to wash my hands like eight, like this number of times. Anything that feels like a must is also worth just talking to a professional about. It might be nothing. It might be nothing, but it's better to talk to a professional and find out that it's nothing than uh, to leave things untreated. So generally what we would say is if there's two functioning areas that are impaired, if there is a development of depression, so anxiety and depression often co-occur together. So if you have anxiety and you're also now developing depression as a result, that is a big treat. When you're having these two things together, it's like the worst twin sisters ever um, or brothers or whatever, uh, or that compulsive anxiety. Uh, so. I'm gonna show you guys this, Panic Attacks, it's a video, hold on. It is by Cindy J. Aronson. What causes panic attacks and how can you prevent them? Okay. Pretty good. The body becomes its own corset. Past, present and future exist as a single force. A swing without gravity soars to a terrifying height. The outlines of people and things dissolve. Countless poets and writers have tried to put words to the experience of a panic attack. A sensation so overwhelming, many people mistake it for a heart attack, stroke, or other life-threatening crisis. Though panic attacks don't cause long-term physical harm, afterwards, the fear of another attack can limit someone's daily life and cause more panic attacks. Studies suggest that almost a third of us will experience at least one panic attack in our lives. And whether it's your first, your hundredth, or you're witnessing someone else go through one, no one wants to repeat the experience. Even learning about them can be uncomfortable, but it's necessary because the first step to preventing panic attacks is understanding them. At its core, a panic attack is an overreaction to the body's normal physiological response to the perception of danger. This response starts with the amygdala, the brain region involved in processing fear. When the amygdala perceives danger, it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, which triggers the release of adrenaline. Adrenaline prompts an increase in the heart and breathing rate to get blood and oxygen to the muscles of the arms and legs. This also sends oxygen to the brain, making it more alert and responsive. During a panic attack, this response is exaggerated well past what would be useful in a dangerous situation, causing a racing heart, heavy breathing, or hyperventilation. The changes to blood flow cause lightheadedness and numbness in the hands and feet. A panic attack usually peaks within 10 minutes. Then the prefrontal cortex takes over from the amygdala and stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. This triggers the release of a hormone called acetylcholine that decreases the heart rate and gradually winds down the panic attack. In a panic attack, the body's perception of danger is enough to trigger the response we would have to a real threat, and then some. We don't know for sure why this happens, but sometimes cues in the environment that remind us of traumatic past experience can trigger a panic attack. 
Panic attacks can be part of anxiety disorders like PTSD, social anxiety disorder, OCD, and generalized anxiety disorder. Recurring panic attacks, frequent worry about new attacks, and behavioral changes to avoid panic attacks can lead to a diagnosis of a panic disorder. The two main treatments for panic disorder are antidepressant medication and cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Both have about a 40% response rate, though someone who responds to one may not respond to the other. However, antidepressant medications carry some side effects, and 50% of people relapse when they stop taking them. CBT, meanwhile, is more lasting, with only a 20% relapse rate. The goal of CBT treatment for panic disorder is to help people learn and practice concrete tools to exert physical and, in turn, mental control over the sensations and thoughts associated with a panic attack. CBT begins with an explanation of the physiological causes of a panic attack, followed by breath and muscle exercises designed to help people consciously control breathing patterns. Next comes cognitive restructuring, which involves identifying and changing the thoughts that are common during attacks, such as believing you'll stop breathing, have a heart attack or die, and replacing them with more accurate thoughts. The next stage of treatment is exposure to the bodily sensations and situations that typically trigger a panic attack. The goal is to change the belief through experience that these sensations and situations are dangerous. Even after CBT, taking these steps isn't easy in the grip of an attack. But with practice, these tools can both prevent and de-escalate attacks and ultimately reduce the hold of panic on a person's life. Outside formal therapy, many panickers find relief from the same beliefs CBT aims to instill that fear can't hurt you, but holding onto it will escalate panic. Even if you've never had a panic attack, understanding them will help you identify one in yourself or someone else, and recognizing them is the first step in preventing them. Okay, back. I'm going to pause now for questions. So um, I'm not going to get a ton into panic attacks uh, beyond kind of what that video showed. Um, panic attacks are both a mental health condition, but can also be a medical health condition. And obviously, um, yeah, uh, I think when it comes to the medical stuff. So one thing to bear in mind, if you're starting to have panic attacks, it's always worth talking to a doctor actually first and foremost, because there are some medical conditions that can cause panic attacks because it actually influences like your cardiovascular system. So it's always worth checking that. Um, I know that video is super overly stimulating, uh, but it's like a whole bunch of information packed into like seven minutes, present better than I ever could from an actual uh, licensed uh, psychologist. Okay. So I had a friend who would sometimes wake up in the middle of the night having a panic attack for no apparent reason. I never understood how a panic attack could be triggered during sleep. Uh, interesting question. I think there's going to be a lot of questions on panic attacks. Um, I'm going to encourage you guys to move it more towards anxiety disorders because that's what we're going to be focusing on is that I'm going to move more directly into social anxiety. Um, so any questions about that versus just panic attacks themselves? I just wanted people to be aware. The main, like pro tips I'll give you is if somebody is having a panic attack, don't actually give them a bag. Um, that's not good for them. Uh, it's, it's just not good. Don't do that. It just decreases the oxygen that they have available to them. Um, try to encourage them to work on slowing their breathing um, and kind of being with them through it. Panic attacks can be super, super distressing. It feels like you're dying. Uh, another pro tip is if you're helping somebody who is having a panic attack, if they ask to go to the ER, take them. <laughs> Never ever say no because they feel like they're dying, but the obviously if they're actually having a cardiovascular event they need to be at the er so what's the best advice just ignore it i wouldn't say just ignore it the main thing that people do so like in cbt cbt is not the only form of therapy by the way that treats panic attacks pretty well uh there are other um therapeutic treatments to most anxiety disorders cbt is one of them um, act therapy is another really common form um, psychoanalytic therapy can also work on this they'll often give you techniques and structure and techniques around basically grounding. Um, so some common grounding techniques would be, for example, um, you could do grounding talks. So sometimes when I've helped people out who are having a panic attack, um, what I've done is I have 
uh, ask them just really simple grounding questions. Do you know where you are right now? Where are you right now? Um, I try to focus on really simple one word answers. And I also often, if I'm noticing somebody having a panic attack, if they're in like a public setting. So like uh, when I worked at camp, right, with a bunch of kids, it's just a bunch of 19 year old untrained adults with children uh, running summer camp and they were at risk teens. So there was a lot of mental health. Um, so what I did, I remember there's a kid having a panic attack. One of the first things I try to do is get them to a slightly more private location. So not private as in like just me and them, obviously, cause you know, child and all those other issues, but away from the group, because if you're having a panic attack and everyone is staring at you, um, it's a little bit anxiety inducing to be stared at while like you're having this panic attack because it's, it can be really distressing, but also like embarrassing. Um, so I try to move them to a more um, secluded location. So typically I would say something like, do you mind if we go hang out in, in, in this case, my boss's office, right? So that way there was, there was three staff there uh, and the kiddo and it got them just away from the other kids who were doing other stuff, right? So do you mind? And that gave them an opportunity to say yes or no. Obviously if they said no, I wouldn't have moved them. Um, then I'll ask them grounding questions just to see basically like, where are you? Do they know where they are? Um, other things that you can do is things like three, two, one, three, two, one. If anyone's ever gone to therapy, you've probably heard about three, two, one. So three, two, one is basically three things you see, two things you hear, one thing you feel, and then you rotate. So I often will rotate senses as well. Um, this is a very, if anyone has gone to therapy, most people have learned either three, two, one or five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one is just all five senses. I just skip smell and taste because my smell is not very good and I usually can't smell anything anyways. And taste, it's like, I usually don't have something in my mouth. So I'm like, I don't know, I taste my tongue, I guess. Um, usually these are the three that I'd rotate through. If you've never heard of this in therapy, that's fine. This is a very, very standard therapeutic technique. Um, if you just Google grounding techniques, this technique is one of the first ones that come up on like most uh, Be Well websites. So. What I typically do is I pair it with breathing. So tell me three things you see, then they'll list them. Or I do this by myself, right? What are three things that I see? So I'll like look around and I'll say like, you know, water bottle, a mic, my mouse. Okay, what are two things that I hear? And I'll close my eyes and listen. Well, I hear the hum of my computer and I can hear the sound of my voice. Okay, what's one thing that I feel? And what you're looking for is some sort of physical stimuli on your body specifically. So I can feel the cuff of my sleeve on my, on my forearm. Um, and then I rotate those. So then I do three things that I hear, two things that I feel, one thing that I see, and then three things that I feel, two things that I see, one thing that I hear. And I just keep rotating them. And I personally, I found for myself, I'd insert breaths in between as well. So three things I see. <sighs> because it grounds you. So this is a way to manage acute anxiety. Um, it's not gonna treat your anxiety long-term necessarily. Um, sometimes it can though, just being good at managing acute can for some people be enough to kind of get them over it. But this is a really good acute, uh, it's, it's basically like a, a brief meditation, yeah. It's basically getting you to focus on present. It's like a mindfulness practice. Um, if somebody's in the midst of a panic attack, I probably wouldn't go here. I'd probably start with getting them to a space that they feel safe in and then asking them, do you know where you are? Um, I'm not going to ask them a ton of questions. I'm not going to ask them to give me lengthy explanations. Do you know where you are right now? Yes. Okay. And then I'll ask them things like, are you presently safe? And they'll kind of look around and they'll say, yes, but they might say, I feel like I'm dying. Okay. okay. Usually if they say that, I'll say, do you want to go to the hospital? Right. I almost always give people that option because I think it's just way safer to do so. Um, I'll ask questions like, is there any risk to your body right now? So if you notice a lot of these questions are yes or no, because if in the middle of a panic attack, a lot of people are having such a hard time getting air in and out fast enough that I want them to be able to just use their head so they can keep their breathing. Um, because you want to make sure that they're getting enough oxygen. Obviously the goal is to get them to slow down their breathing, but you're not going to do that by like forcing them to talk and making them feel even more out of breath. You're going to get them to do that by getting them to slowly increase the length of their inhales and their exhales, right? I'm here with you. You're safe. Stuff like that. Yeah. It, th that's the main thing. This is why every single person who's trained typically in psychotherapy is always told, uh, 
This is what I've both trained my staff on and been trained on, which is always, 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 if a panic attack is occurring, allow them to call the ER. If they complain about heart and like breathing issues, especially if you don't know them well, you just need to take them. Like they, they need to go see a doctor because you don't want to risk that it's actually a cardiovascular event. Cause like, you don't know, you're not a magician. Not gonna lie, if people would ask pe these questions while in a panic mode, I would die. You would gauge it a little bit. I've found these questions have always worked really well, actually, in um, when I've like talked with kiddos and stuff. Um, that way, like for example, is there any risk to your body right now? If they like point to an area that's like in pain, like if they're like there's a pinching pain, and they like point to like where like maybe their appendix is, that that's really useful information. That's just like good health information to know, right? Because then then I'm obviously calling 911. Annoyed ER employee noises. Hey, I get it, ER employee noises, but I'm gonna be honest, we don't wanna risk, I, I, I don't wanna be the person who's like, you're not having a cardiovascular event, you're just having a panic attack, and then they keel over because they actually have, we're having a heart attack like that. Uh, nobody wants to be that person. Um, bad look. Now I have a much less pretty thing. So I'm gonna walk you through the rest of the information rather than, so now I'm gonna focus on exclusively social anxiety. Okay, so we've talked broadly about anxiety. I covered panic attacks briefly, but mostly just to kind of like let people know like what they look like and to call the doctor basically. So I tend to worry how wide reaching that experience is for people with anxiety. I learned that a great deal of my dissociation was a coping mechanism for what my body feels like to be in. And that's kind of, that was deaf a hard, yeah. Could you talk about the relationships between social anxiety, social skills, and confidence? What causes that and how are they intertwined? Yes, I can. In fact, this next little bit that I get into talks directly about that. So stay tuned, Joe Tone. Mindfulness makes things far worse for me. Oh, okay. I understand what you're saying. Um, I remember when I was like 19, I had really, really intense dissociation. Um, when I was like between the ages of like probably 16 to 19. And yeah, I also hated mindfulness techniques a lot um what i would recommend three to one is a little bit easier for the dissociation specifically because it gives you something to focus on other than the distress within your body because i would say basically say mindfulness techniques when i was in dissociation felt like i was peeking over a ledge which was the rest of my body and at the bottom was like screaming like like just a horror scene and i was like no thank you i don't want to see that i'm good um three two one was a bit of a better acute anxiety manager for somebody for at least me when i was dissociated obviously if a professional that you are working with gives you different advice follow that but i found that helped me with my dissociation was the three two one because it gives me something to focus on other than just my body like it's a little bit of the body you get the feel a little bit but i can still say external so basically tricking your brain into forgetting it's panicking by focusing on other things yes and focusing on like the interesting thing of grounding techniques is you're tricking your body to be calm by focusing in on what your body sensations actually are so noticing for example being like my heart is racing really fast but there isn't actually pain right so being like okay right and and kind of getting these like little noticing factors okay so what is social anxiety so as i talked about anxiety disorders are essentially disproportionate and typically leading to dysfunction in a couple of areas of your life that your reaction, your anxious reactions to events are bigger than seem kind of normative or reasonable for the event, right? So in the case of social anxiety, it's reasonable to feel shy and anxious in a social exchange sometimes. However, if you feel it all the time or you feel it to an extreme degree that it like debilitates you from ever like meeting new people, um, if it's blending, if it's generalizing to like even just when you're around your friends and stuff like that, um, that's where we're getting into the social anxiety, maybe uh, disorder. Um, but remember, all these things are spectrum. Yeah. So remember, there is a spectrum of experience. There's so you can feel socially anxious and Thanks. not have social anxiety disorder. And your feelings of social anxiety are valid, important, and need to be looked at. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have the diagnosis. I try to leave the diagnosis up to the professionals. I'm not going to diagnose anybody. I'm not interested in it. Um, however, it's really important to identify what's going on for you, right? That way you can communicate it. And feelings of social anxiety are decently common. And if they become pervasive and constant all the time, they're worth looking at. So social anxiety is actually one of the most common uh, mental health disorders on the planet. It's got a prevalence rate of about 8 2.8 to 7%. So almost, 
almost 10% of the population. It's also a really unique mental health disorder in that it's a mood disorder that endures for a super, super long time. So some people, for example, I'm trying to remember, I don't know what the average number of years is, but for some people, they'll go untreated with social anxiety for like 25 years. Um, We're not... Basically, the reason why this is, is not because social anxiety is so untreatable, but because social anxiety is almost antithetical to the process of therapy, right? Social anxiety is distinct. It's not shyness. It's not lack of social skill. It's distinctly a fear of negative evaluation in social interactions. So it's not, I'm afraid of social interactions because it's specifically, I'm afraid of being viewed as weird, creepy, awkward, lame, boring, just some negative evaluation of others based on my interactions with them. And if you imagine therapy is sitting down one-on-one with a professional to get scrutinized (laughs) socially (laughs) the entire time. Now, therapy is very effective. It's not, unless your therapist really sucks, they're not going to make you feel scrutinized. They're going to make you hopefully feel understood and seen. But this is why a lot of people with social anxiety disorder can be really resistant to going and getting treating treatment because it sounds like a nightmare. They're like, hmm, so you want me to pay somebody to just sit in front of them and they'll just tell me everything that's wrong with me for an hour straight? Mm, I'm good. I do that in my brain for free. <laughs> I don't need it. Um, but that's not how therapy actually works. Um, as somebody who had v- very intense social anxiety uh, struggles, and also into therapy for it, it works really well. Social anxiety feelings are super common. 50 to 60% of people report feeling social anxiety most, uh, some of the time. Um, there's very, very few people who just never have experienced social anxiety ever. And we all hate those people. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, Nick is one of those. He's just never been socially anxious ever. He's never feared a negative evaluation. And in his mind, if somebody like interacts with him and they think he's a piece of shit based on his interaction or whatever, he's like, oh, so they kind of suck. And I'm like, imagine the superpower of walking away from a social interaction and they thought negative of you. Literally, they, you know that they did. And you can just say fuck you to them. Like, wow, <laughs> amazing. Um, one thing that's um, important is that there's kind of this fear of being perceived so a lot of people with SAD will report common fears of being perceived as weak as crazy as anxious as stupid boring intimidating dirty or unlikable those are the common phrases that people will report with social anxiety that they're afraid of being perceived as so I'll say those again, weak, obviously this is not limited. There are, you can have other feelings about it, but these are the feelings that socially anxious people report most often. Weak, crazy, anxious, stupid, boring, intimidating, dirty, or unlikable. So there's the distinctive low self-evaluation that goes with it as well, right? So even mild social anxiety can often have significant impacts on self-esteem and self-perception. So this can produce kind of disproportionately negative perceptions of their own performance and their uh, and others' reactions to themselves. So there's really interesting research on this actually um, that showed that a lot of people with social anxiety, so this is what Joe Tone talked about, is there a relationship between social anxiety and social skill uh, and confidence? So there is a relationship between confidence and social anxiety, which is that when you have more social anxiety, you tend to feel way less confident, which makes sense, right? Um, you feel less capable, you feel more overcome by it. However, social anxiety is not predictive of social skill at all. So while you're constantly afraid that you're failing socially, the reality is that you're usually not. In fact, most of the times when socially anxious people actually begin to struggle and fail in social interactions, it's produced by their social anxiety, being hyper aware of them, not, not because they actually just suck at social interactions, right? So... Um, there was one really interesting study where you had a whole bunch of people who were filmed and had to talk in like a group conversation and everyone was kind of forced to talk. And at the end of the group discussion, they had to rate how they felt they did. And then there were observers who rated the film itself and they had to rate everyone's social performance in the group based on the film. And they, it was multiple observers and they cross-referenced their observations to make sure that they were rating similarly. Et cetera, et cetera. It was very researchy, confounding valuables were gone. Don't worry, it was real research. Okay, so what they found is that socially anxious people rated their performance in a social domain really low and 
the observers of the interactions rated them usually about average. Their, their results of their social performance varied as much as everyone else. There was no difference in the socially anxious group to the non-socially anxious group. The only difference was the self-perception of failure. So most people with high social anxiety get a really low self-esteem and a negative self-perception of basically like, I'm a failure, I'm weird, people don't like me. And the reality is that's not usually true. In another study that they did with socially anxious person, people, they, so a lot of people who are socially anxious, when they're asked to rate, for example, faces, different facial expressions, they're more likely to assume, and, and in the study they're told, imagine somebody's making this face at you. What do you think it means? They were more likely to take neutral faces, like just like staring at you as negative and positive faces as just neutral so a lot of social what it, social anxiety does is it skews your your mindset towards a more negative so this is actually uh flies in contradiction has anybody ever heard of the concept depressive realism anyone ever heard of that Yes, the donation queue is for the stream, just to continue. I usually go for about four hours. I Basically, I'm going to end when I'm done this talk. If you want me to cover more stuff, um, I want to try to get this filled. So, yeah. Anyone ever heard of depression realism? Depressive realism, sorry. Okay, I have a couple of you. So depressive realism was this theory that, so there was one study that found that depressed people had a more accurate perception of their performance than other people. It found that basically people who weren't depressed tend to rated their performances much better than, and like much better than it actually was, whereas depressive people were much better at evaluating their own performance accurately. So that idea was persistent for a really long time, which flies in the face of basically all of CBT theory modeling, because the idea that somebody's cognitions would be more accurate when depressed doesn't make sense when CBT kind of argues that like depressive moods and like basically cognitive distortions co-occur together to somewhat create and facilitate the mental health problem. That's depressive realism. I have good news though. Um, there was a new recent meta-analysis that came out. I believe it came out in like 2019, something like that, that looked at depressive realism for replication across like the last 40 years of research. And it basically found that there's no evidence of depressive realism. It means then that when you're having a mental health crisis, when you're experiencing high levels of anxiety or depression, you are not perceiving the world as accurately as other people. You're actually experiencing distortions in your thinking. This is why, for example, people with social anxiety are going to perceive a neutral expression as a negative evaluation of them, right? So if they're talking to somebody, say you're talking to somebody and the person you're talking to starts like kind of looking off around you a socially anxious person might go they're bored they're bored of me i'm boring them whereas a somebody who's not socially anxious might be like i wonder what's over there <laughs> right um and and the reality is that the person was looking away it's possible that they were thinking i tend to look up and away when i'm thinking it's possible that there is something over there that they're looking at it's also just possible that they got distracted they're not bored they just got distracted right um and so a lot of socially anxious people tend to read into things that aren't there and perceive things way more negatively, particularly in how people feel about them, right? So this was like a common thing when Nick and I first started dating as we would like spend time with his friends or like people I didn't know. And I'd be like, none of them like me. They all hated me. They thought I was boring and weird. And he's like, what? Like you were a little quiet, but that's about it. Like people are shy. And I was like, no, nope. they thought I was weird. And he was like, okay, <laughs> I don't think that's true, but you know, I'm not going to fight with you. Um, this is very classic in like the socially anxious person. It's just like everyone hates them, even though every single person around them is like, you're just normal. Like you're just nice. It'd be nice if you talked more. You're a little shy, but like, yeah, you're fine. If you've been diagnosed with complex PTSD, a lot of what you're saying about social anxiety sounds similar. Is it, or are they two different animals? So complex PTSD is not a true DSM-5 diagnosis. You should not be being diagnosed with it. The professional who did diagnose you is giving you probably a label to help you understand the things, but it is not a recognized diagnosis. What it is, is essentially some element of my life is super fucked up, so I have a lot of dysfunction as a result. Um, I don't... I don't feel that there is good value to having the diagnosis of complex PTSD because it essentially isn't a very meaningful diagnosis because it leads to more confusion than anything else. I don't know, I don't know what's going on for you specifically, um, but if you have like 
what I say, childhood fucked up, I fucked up syndrome, which is basically what complex PTSD is trying to do. The reason why if you have childhood trauma or childhood distressing events and stuff like that, repeated, repeated distressing events throughout your life, the reason why they want to create a disorder for that is that we know that that type of experience kind of fucks you over and makes you de have a major areas of dysfunction in your adulthood. The issue is that it's not easy to predict w how that childhood fuckery is going to affect you later on because the way that it affects you is going to depend on who was doing the harmful things to you what your personality is how old you were how repeated it was how extreme it was right so people's reactions are really different so it's worth getting a diagnosis of ptsd from your childhood which you can get you can get a ptsd diagnosis if you have flashbacks and, and actual PTSD symptoms from your childhood, that's going to be really valuable. But more so what we're going to start seeing is people with the childhood fucked up, I fucked up syndrome will kind of collect a number of diagnoses because we're trying to kind of collect all the dysfunctions together being like, yeah, they've got some major social issues, social anxiety issues. They maybe also have broad depression issues. And so it's extremely unsatisfying. I, I hope at some point that we do come up with a proper diagnostic label that maybe has all the specifiers required. The issue is complex PTSD as it stands right now doesn't do that sufficiently. Um, so what I would focus on more so for you is, is focus on your symptomology with your therapist. Be like, when they're saying complex PTSD, what does that mean to you? Like, what are you saying? What symptoms are you saying when you say complex PTSD? How does that impact you? Which symptoms are the most impactful broad band? Is it the anxiety? Can you go get treatment for anxiety? Are you getting treatment for anxiety? Is it the depression? Is it complex anxiety, depression? You should go get treated for those two complex things. Is it self-narrative? Do you not know who you are? And the lack of self-identity is like fucking with you? Then you should do more like narrative, maybe some psychoanalytic therapy. So I know that that's extremely unsatisfying answer. Um, and obviously that's, that's gonna be my predilection. Somebody else might disagree. I think fundamentally you should do what is most helpful to you. So if the complex PTSD diagnosis is in your mind helpful and does lead to good outcomes, you should do that. And obviously you should take a professional who knows you more than you should take mine. No one has ever said I'm weird, but I'm convinced they treat me that way. Something like this? Yes. Yes, exactly. Good, good reorientation back to the social anxiety stuff. Okay. So it's not shyness. It's also not introversion. So introverts aren't necessarily socially anxious. Introverts just basically, it's mostly a measure of, it's a complex measure of there's a couple of subcategories of essentially, it's an element of like brazenness, like how much you like, high extroverted people almost always take leadership roles um, because they're interested in interacting with others and kind of taking the lead and spearheading and stuff like that. And there's kind of like the colloquial like, extroverted people get like filled up by being around other people they get their energy from it whereas introverted people need more alone time to be able to manage being around other people but somebody who has introverted isn't necessarily socially anxious they're not the same thing okay um so here's one thing that we do have to talk about which is what happens when you have co-occurring social anxiety and lack of social ability so as i've said before Socially awkward does not mean socially anxious, right? Lack of social skill doesn't necessarily mean that the person is socially anxious. And in fact, most socially anxious people are completely fine performing social. They have completely normal social skills. That's not the issue. The issue is for people who don't know the rules of engagement. Um, a lot of people actually with social skill problems, so they lack social awareness, they often don't have a ton of social anxiety about it because they don't realize, right? If social anxiety is the fear of negative perceptions, if you imagine if you're socially anxious, you're always reining in your behavior and checking yourself to keep yourself from doing something that people are going to be annoyed by. If you're socially weird, you probably don't have that check very well because you're doing constant social faux pas and you're not stopping, right? And so a lot of people who are um, who lack social skills they don't always have the, the co-occurring social anxiety. They might have, for example, some sort of like um, negative self-esteem because they keep doing social faux pas and people get mad at them. So they kind of start to hate themselves a little bit, but I don't as find as much that there's this expression. And in fact, in the literature, we don't see these two things co-occurring together. Um, one of the best ways to tell, like, do you have social skills is, are you a person who says, yeah, I'm not a group person, but I'm really good at one-on-one -on -one conversations. Is that you? 
if you're a person that's groups, I fall apart. I'm not very skilled in groups, but one-on-one, I'm really good at having these conversations. That is a cue that you don't have a social skills problem. You have a social anxiety problem exclusively, right? Um, If you're really good at talking one-on-one, if you can maintain deep, close personal friendships with people and have great conversations one-to-one, that is a cue that your social skills are totally fine. Okay. There might be things here or there that you could tweak. Everyone can be better, more charismatic, obviously. But if you're able to do that one-on-one dynamic, here's your peace of mind. You have social skills. You just also have social anxiety. So don't. here's the key thing. Don't let the social anxiety trick you into thinking that you are worse than you are. It's lying. It's lying to you. It's trying to protect you, but it's lying. It's wrong. You are completely fine. It's just your anxiety taking over a little bit. Okay, that's kind of the, the rule of thumb. Um, so what does a day in a life look like for somebody with social anxiety disorder? Um, I'm going to talk to you, to start out talking about this, I'm going to talk to you about something called the belongingness hypothesis. So the belongingness hypothesis was written by a man named Bauermeister and his friends, you know, et al., Bauermeister and friends. Bauermeister is the kind of the spearheader, the champion of the theory. He's the one attributed with kind of the creation of the theory. The belongingness hypothesis is a very, very fundamental um, understanding of human need. So it's basically a claim, the belongingness hypothesis claims that humans are motivated by a fundamental drive to have a minimum quantity of stable, positive, and caring relationships to belong to a group to some degree. Social anxiety necessarily separates you from this fundamental drive. In fact, belongingness hypothesis has now been recognized as a fundamental need for human beings, right? This is actually why in like jails where they have uh, isolation and whatnot, there's a bunch of strict rules about isolation. I'm not saying it's always properly followed and I'm not saying it's a perfect system, but we've kind of recognized that leaving people on like seclusion or an isolation from other people for extended periods of time is like basically torturous it's it doesn't just make them lonely it makes people go crazy um having a sense of belonging to others having a couple of close friendships and relationships in your life are a need they're a fundamental need for psychological functioning right i think in maslow's hierarchy it's like third um some would argue maybe it's like lower on that hard to say Um, I feel like it's because of all the pressure is on you. It's like no longer divided. Yes, absolutely. So there are a couple, I will be clear. There are a very few disorders, personality disorders specifically, that cause people to not seem to have much of this drive. However, they're decently rare. I'm not saying that they don't exist, right? Obviously they do. Um, but there is a couple of, uh, on the schizo spectrum, there's a couple people with personality disorders that do not desire relationships and don't seem to be ha- to have kind of this really big drive. In fact, one of the hallmarks of the disorder is that they actively avoid and don't want these types of relationships. But barring this like kind of smaller group, um, everyone else has a fundamental need for human connection, right? No man is an island. Social anxiety is the thing that separates you from that thing, right? If you desire connection with other people, but you're also afraid of that connection, it leaves you in this space of like freezing, right? Your part of your behavioral system wants to basically, it's called behavioral, um, behavioral approach, right? It drives you to want to seek out the things that you need. So you're going to approach food. That's why you do motivated behaviors towards food seeking and water seeking when you're thirsty. Another thing that your system is going to push you to do is to have connections. It's going to push you to want to form relationships with others and social anxiety makes that thing fearful. So you also want to avoid it. And at the same time, you live in this perpetual cycle of distress because you want the thing that you don't know how to get and you're too afraid to leave your house to go and get it, right? So it's extremely lonely for a lot of people and it's extremely distressing because you're so damn lonely, but you can't fix it because you're so afraid to go out and talk to new people and make new friends. You don't know how to do it. You're so afraid that people are gonna not like you. And it's like, you're so desperate for connection that the idea that you could go out and somebody will reject you is like shattering. It's so, it's so freezing. Like you're just stuck in this state of like, 
it's really truly like if you close your eyes and you picture you're standing on a frozen lake and there's popping and cracking and you can tell that the ice is about to give but you can't move because it'll make it fall faster but if you don't get off the ice off the lake you're gonna die right it's both of these things at the same time this is what social anxiety feels like for people it's an extremely internalized disorder. So there's two types of kind of mood disorders and, and disorders that we look at. We kind of break mental health into ex- internalizing and externalizing disorders. It is an internalizing disorder, which means it turns us within ourselves, right? It, we as humans have this kind of weird capacity that we can evaluate ourselves uh, within ourselves. So I can look in and go, what is Kyla doing that is good or bad, smart or stupid? It's the, uh, yes, existential anticipate. And, uh, and t- existential anticipation. Thank you. Um, right? So we can think about situations and evaluate how we did, how we felt. And this is a self-respection and introspection is a, in this, in this far, it seemed, introspection seems to be a decently uniquely human capacity. Although I'll be honest, we're not very good at studying human, uh, like non-human cognition. So who fucking knows? But we, at this point, attribute it fundamentally at a very like surface level to humans most often, right? Um, the issue is that social anxiety is a, is in part an over internalization. You become so negatively fixated on your own behavior and so self-critical that you begin to fail in the external world, right? Paying such close attention to yourself that you stop paying attention to others and the fixation on your, on yourself creates its own problem. So the only times where, again, we start seeing, Ooh, that scared me. Um, Huberman says there's hypo, hyper introspection. Yeah, hyper introspection. And so when we see people with social anxiety starting to fail in social dynamics, it's almost exclusively because they're failing to pick up on cues from other people around them because they're so internally focused, right? They're so fixated on like, do I smile now? Does my smile look weird? Am I saying the right things? What should I say next? That they'll miss kind of subtle cues from the people that they're talking to of basically like, interested in talking about something else or, or a positive feedback about a topic that they're talking about. So they'll kind of miss it and it'll leave them constantly like missing people. So when I think about it, you know, when I think about like my bout through social anxiety, which was really bad, like my social anxiety was so bad and my loneliness got so intense that like I was becoming suicidal because I was so fucking lonely and I hated myself so much. Right. And it was like, I would be in a conversation and it was like, in the conversation, I would look out into the world and I just saw mirrors pointing back at me and they were very critical mirrors, right? I was talking at somebody and the entire time I was talking at somebody, I was thinking about myself specifically in my failure, right? So it's, it sounds selfish and in some ways it's, it's certainly self-focused, um, but I'm not putting myself up above others. I'm constantly trying to fix myself right so you're not talking to another person you're talking to a mirror that you're kind of like reading off of to to give you cues of what you're doing wrong and failing at it's a deeply it's a deeply mind fucking disorder Um, most mental health problems are very mind fucking how did you get out of that hole that's where i am at right now i will get there i promise i'm gonna take you guys down and i'm gonna bring you back up okay I'm not going to leave you at, uh, just at the bottom being like, oh, so it is miserable. Um, how do we distinguish between avoidant personality disorder and social anxiety? Um, almost exclusively the way that you're going to differentiate something like avoidance versus social anxiety is going to be the emotional language that the person attaches to their behaviors, right? So... Uh, and sometimes these two things can co-occur together. Um, it's really, this is why diagnosis really is, this is why self noticing, like identifying your symptomology is very important, but diagnosis is very complicated and you should really leave it to a trained professional. And I don't even think most trained professionals should be doing it. I don't think your GP should be diagnosing you with mental health problems. I think somebody trained with like neuropsych assessment or clinical psychologist trained on testing and evaluation, anyone trained well on testing and evaluation and diagnostics should be the only people diagnosing you in my view. Um, but it is good to notice like, okay, am I avoiding personality disorder or social anxiety? Well, what does it feel like? Like what's going on for you? Is your thought, I don't want to deal with this, like yucky? Or is it, this is so fearful. I want it, but I'm so afraid of it. Like, which is it, right? Because yuck, I don't want to deal is a very different kind of emotional 
energy, essentially, than I want this, but I'm terrified of it. Those are very different experiences. Damn, I feel bad for the socially anxious people have to run off and get dinner now. True, if you had just ordered HelloFresh, you could have been cooking very quickly, pre-portioned, and been done and been back to get the rest of this talk in the next, like, 10 minutes. Um, you're welcome, ultimate splash damage. And don't try to get a diagnosis just because your friends are and you want to feel special. Only if you go... I mean, I don't think most people are trying to get a diagnosis to feel special. I think there's some of that, but I think, like, that's an insensitive way of viewing it. I think a lot of people are seeking a diagnosis because they live in a state of distress and, and despair. And there's something really helpful for having a label to categorize it, right? To say, this is the thing, especially because in our society, we care a lot about these labels, right? So if I tell you, I have this unknown, not really diagnosed gut problem, but it might be a genetic disorder because in general, my my cells don't absorb the right amounts of water we think because I have dry everything. My eyes are dry to the point that I can't wear contacts, right? other dry areas that I won't mention. My skin is insanely dry. My hair falls out because my scalp gets so dry and so underhydrated, like to the point that like when you massage it, it like aches because there's not enough like blood in my scalp a lot of the time. And I get IBS symptoms because there's not enough like liquid in my guts a lot of time to like move things along. That's a really hard thing. But if I say I have IBS, people are like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is why we seek these labels. Because if I just go Right, if I try to explain my brain injury, right? I'm like, my brain injury causes like, you know, some intentional concentration, but also like some word swapping. But if I just say, I have a TBI, or like back in the past with schooling, I just, my doctor just gave me the ADHD diagnosis. I don't have ADHD, but I needed all of the supports that ADHD people get, right? So it's like, that's the tricky thing with this thing is like, if you're self IDing and you're never seeking treatment for it, that's a really big problem. Because at that point, your, di your self-diagnosis isn't aimed to help yourself in any way. I would argue it might actually be doing harm. A diagnosis should be leading to good, better Just outcomes. Don't. All right. So that's the day, a day in the life, okay, of a socially anxious person. It is a constant state of like reaching, of wanting, and afraid to reach, right? I, I'm, I want this thing. I don't just want it. I need it. Belongingness is a need. And I'm terrified of it. I want to reach, but I'm terrified of what will happen to me when I do, right? It's, it's the constant freezing paralysis, and it leads to an extremely lonely life because you can't connect with others, especially when it starts generalizing, right? My social anxiety started with others from high school, just being mean. So like people I wasn't super close with. And then it started generalizing to the point where I started feeling that like my close friends maybe didn't like me as much anymore. And I would read into the behavior where they were just like busy. They were dating and I was single, right? Like normal stuff that like sucks. It sucks that when you're single and 21 and all of your friends are dating, you end up being alone a lot of the time and nobody wants to hang out with you because your friends are all dating and you don't want to be like, hi, I'm your third wheel. Like <laughs> Cumin's here, <laughs> salt, pepper, and Cuban, do, 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 you know, um, it's extremely lonely and the only way forward is through it the only way forward is cultivating bravery which isn't to not be afraid but to just like force yourself over and over to face your dragon basically all right so i'm gonna give you an example we got our friend susie okay susie was invited to a dorm party recently. And she is in her first year of university. She was in a small town before, she kind of knew everyone. And then she came here and she was like, I don't know anyone in this big town. And it's it's been nerve wracking. She was used to just knowing every face around her. And poor Susie, yes, yeah, Susie Q, exactly. Poor Susie, you know, she's going to this party, she walks into the dorm room and before she opens the door, she could hear all the noise, the music, people shouting, sounds like there's maybe beer pong going on behind you. We all know, you don't know exactly what it sounds like, right? And her heart is just pounding and she feels sick to her stomach. Likely, at this point, she's already, she, in her head, she's already panicking. Okay, Susie, don't be weird and don't be boring. You gotta make some friends, right? This is your chance, you know, it's day, it's week one at the dorm. You gotta make some friends, okay? Don't be weird, don't be boring. Just be cool, Susie, be cool, be cool. You're fine, you got this, you got this, you got this. Um, and I like to use intense kind of emotive language. The party 
is the eye of Sauron that is judging your performance. It is staring at you. It is the feared thing that you are walking toward. So Susie walks in and she reminds, and she begins to respond in a way that makes her seem kind of defensive, right? Some people are like, oh, you're from a small town? And she'd be like, yeah, is that a problem? Um, or, right? So she'll either do the, the defensive, because there's kind of two ways I've seen social anxiety expressed. And some people, they do like, the, this is their social anxiety. They're like super anxious and nervous, and they're super submissive. And people are like, hi, Susie. And they're like, hi. I'm like, how are you doing? She's like, mm, I'm okay. And it's like really hard to converse with them. And then there's the other socially anxious. This was my type of social anxiety where I, yeah, meek. Yeah, my social anxiety was I'm so anxious, but I can't let anyone know. That would be weakness. No, so I'm going to pretend to be confident. But in the midst of pretending, I am going to be so anxious that I basically can't talk. So I had the beautiful power of when I was socially anxious, I looked like a bitch. <laughs> Yay! So I would walk in, I'd tip my chin up, walk in with my head high, and I'd be like, you know, very confident but I wouldn't make in conversation with anyone, would make eye contact with no one. Not because I'm a bitch, not because I don't care, because I was fucking terrified. I couldn't look into the ISR and I couldn't do it, right? So I would make no eye contact and I would just sit there and I wouldn't even go on my phone, no. I was just there observing them. And I'm sure they all thought, who is this queen, you know? So you've got kind of the two options. You're either submissive or you're uh, aloof, but still anxious, so never actually engaging others. Um, and it doesn't read you don't make conversation as well as maybe you would like probably the main thing people will notice is that you're quiet right that's probably going to be the main comment they're like no you're fine you're just a little quiet that's going to be like the most that's the most common feedback i think socially anxious get people get it's like am i weird people are like no you're just quiet and then socially anxious people go quiet is weird and you're like no bro you're just quiet <laughs> right so then they're sitting there Susie q's sitting there she's either hunched in or doing the fake tough thing and she is fixated on herself so she's sitting there you know she's sitting in a very precise way she's like oh you know i'm sitting like this but maybe they'll think i'm a slut because i'm like pushing my chest together so then she's like okay i'll sit like this but like this is kind of uncomfortable so like maybe i'll sit like this or maybe i'll just like ball up oh and like you know let's add some body insecurity on top of that they're like oh but when i sit i get like rolls on my belly so then i'm gonna hold a pillow in front of me so that nobody can see my fat rolls and oh like you know i had a zit the other day and it's like on my chin so when i talk to people i'm gonna like have my hand covering my chin all the time but it's gonna get kind of weird because i'm gonna like go out of my way to keep a hand on my chin so they'll be like here's susie and you've got like a drink susie's got like a drink in one hand and her hand over her chin and then they're like here's susie have some food and she's like thank you and they're like you're welcome and she's like thank you for the food and they're like okay she's like <laughs> i glued my hand here right like i mean what do you even say okay so being internalizing and focusing on yourself and you are scrutinizing yourself and because Susie q is scrutinizing herself she doesn't notice when the nut the quiet girl beside her finally gets up the gull because everyone's socially anxious at the at the dorm parties i'm gonna tell you 60% of the people there are just as anxious as you and just as awkward. I promise. I promise. Okay. So the girl next to you is goes like, hi, Susie. But Susie doesn't hear it because she's too fi fixated on her weird zit on her chin. And she's like, I picked it once when I like walked in and I got like, I thought nobody was looking and now I know it's red. So I'm super embarrassed. And she's like trying to grab the food. And then the girl beside her tries to make conversation but because she's so internalized. She's so focused on herself that this girl just thinks, oh my gosh, Susie Q is so cool. She doesn't like me. And now poor socially anxious girl over here, the meek one is like, oh, okay. Well, I tried and failed, right? And Susie Q just didn't notice because she was too busy being socially anxious. And the whole time she was like trying to figure out how to carry the plate and her drink and cover her zit, right? Everyone knows, everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about. This is why you're all like just blasting up because every one of you has either seen met a Susie Q or been a Susie Q or Susie Q's poor not friend right and Susie the whole time she's like maybe trying to converse she sees like that cute guy and she's like oh I kind of want to talk to him you know you know I'm like oh, hi Kobe but it's loud and, and Kobe doesn't really hear and then she's like okay fuck what I gotta try again I gotta try again like I'm gonna it's weird now because like the people in in front of me like turned and looked at me and heard me call Kobe and saw him and he didn't respond so then I'm like uh huh hi Kobe and she like yells louder and then Kobe turns around and he's like oh hey um Sarah 
And then Susan's like, oh no, I'm stupid. He doesn't like me. Do I sound weird? Oh my gosh, he thinks my name is Sarah. My name is Susie. I, I shouldn't correct him though. I don't want him to hate me. Like what if he gets mad because I correct him? Um, Just go with it. Just go with it, Susie. Sarah, I am Sarah now. I have become Sarah, all right? And then you've embodied Sarah. And you're like, oh yeah, um, you know, uh, you know, but he, he notices the like weird, awkward pause. And so he gets kind of awkward. And he's like, oh gosh, this girl doesn't like me. You know, because Susie does the mask where she looks really confident. When, so when she does the awkward pause, am I Sarah or am I Susie now? Her face looks like this. She's holding the food in her hand. She's like, and now Kobe's like, oh, what the fuck? Does she, is she okay? Does she not like me? Like, I don't know what's going on. She's like, sup, Kobe. And then Kobe's like, hey, sup. And then she's panicking. She doesn't have anything to say because she's not interesting. She doesn't have any interesting hobbies. She just moved from a small town. So then she's like, um, I'm from a small town. And Kobe's like, yeah, I, I know. We talked about that, like, uh, when you first moved in. And she's like, oh, okay. Shit. Dead end, right? And Susie Sarah is fucked now, okay? Sh Susie Sarah is fucked, you know? She's got her name tag on. And she's like, well, I got to cover that now. You know, you know, so now her hands are like this. Uh, poor girl on the couch is just like, was just withdrawing into herself. She's like, look at Susie. She's so cool. She's talking to Kobe, the hot guy. And she just didn't even want to talk to me. Okay. You begin to respond in unnatural ways because you're covering your zit. You're holding your cup weird. You're Sarah now. Who the fuck is Sarah? You're trying to make a backstory for yourself because if you're going to be Sarah, you're going to be fucking Sarah, which means you're not Susie from a small town. No, you're Sarah, the socialite from rich mom and dad. And so you start talking to him. You start making up weird shit and be like, oh, yeah, um, I also have like a, a, a fancy Bichon dog. And Kobe's like, oh, sick. No way. Did you get it from this breeder? And you're like, yes, I did. And then he starts talking about the breeder, but you don't know anything. You don't have, you don't have a Bichon dog. You're not rich. You don't know this breeder. And he's like, so anyways, like, what did you think of their kennels? Like, uh, isn't that, you know, and he asks you some question about the kennels and you, and you just try to answer it because pff, you can't sound weird. You've bought into Sarah. Sarah is who you are. And Sarah would say, oh, you know, I, um, those, those kennel facilities were really nice. And then Kobe looks at you weird. He's like, kennels? And you're like, yeah. And he's like, what do you mean? It's a free range dog breeding site. It doesn't do unethical things like having kennels for dogs. There's no kennel, ke kennel on site. Are you sure you got your dog from the same breeder? And now the jig's up. He knows that you're not Sarah. He knows you don't have a Bichon. Now you're a liar. Now you're weird, awkward, and you lied. And it's actually really awkward because people are going to find out not only that you lied about being rich and having a Bichon dog, but that your name isn't even Sarah. You're Susie. You've always been Susie. And you get slammed back into Susie's body. You are not Sarah. You are Susie. And Susie sucks and nobody likes her, right? And so you just feel like you're not doing a good job. And then people become uncomfortable with Susie because she's uncomfortable not because they think she's weird but they can tell that she's nervous and they're like oh man what am I doing to like make Sir Susie so nervous right and so they're like well she seems kind of awkward so I'm not going to keep bugging her and then people start leaving and not wanting to talk to her as much because you know they don't want to stress her out it seems like they're stressing her out and Susie's like fuck nobody wants to talk to me they heard about the Sarah incident I'm screwed right and as you become more and Susie becomes more and more self-focused Every interaction is more awkward to the point that she finally retreats back to the couch and she turns to that quiet girl. And she's like, hi, I'm Susie. And the girl's like, oh, hi. And it's just awkward because Susie's like, hi, I'm Susie and I'm Sarah. And the girl's like, I don't, what? And she's like, I'm both. I am both people. And she's like, I don't know. Who, I don't, so are you Susie or Sarah? Or is it a hyphenated name? And you're like, I don't, I don't know anymore. I don't know anymore. And then it loops. And then it loops. That's a day in the life of a socially anxious person. All right. The story's giving me anxiety. Good. That was the point. And I'm going to tell you one more thing, especially the dorm party life. The best way that people break out of this social anxiety is alcohol. Because it gets those inhibitions off. And they're like, oh, I'm not so nervous. Now I'm having this cool. And people are like, oh my gosh, Susie, get two beers in you and you're a fucking cool, man. And this can be a very, very dangerous relationship that somebody begins to build with drugs because they need the drugs to get over the social anxiety and to be functional. And the more you need drugs to medicate yourself, the less healthy of a relationship you will have with that drug. I don't like her because she's a liar, not because her anxiety. Damn, Susie just can't get a break. So... Let's go over some common myths about social anxiety. So some people would say, I have social anxiety because when I 
do public speaking or when I go to large events where I know nobody, I am socially anxious. This is not, this. you are socially anxious. This doesn't mean that you have like problematic social anxiety. It's reasonable enough to be afraid of large events. That's how it started with me and weed and I'm still trying to kick the habit. Absolutely, yeah. This is how, this is the, this is the self, this is the anxiety self-medication loop, right? especially with social anxiety and dorm life partying because alcohol is already there. It's already available. It just takes a bit of the edge off and then you need more and more to take the edge off and you're trying to go to these parties every week to make friends because you're lonely and you're sad and things are stressful and you're drinking more so that you can maintain a buzz and it just like it, it becomes and to be clear, binge drinking every weekend can be considered a substance use disorder as well, right? So this is a really common substance use disorders in like young college students or like high school students and stuff often look like binging on weekends, right? So they don't use every single day throughout the week, but every weekend they binge hard to be able to like maintain and function within social situations. I haven't tried drugs or alcohol yet to feel comfortable, but I'm always tense and hate making people feel weird or awkward around me because I get really stressed. I stutter or when I get excited because I'm talking to someone, so I trip over my words and it's so embarrassing. I feel that in my soul, pumpkin eater. Not the, not that I understand the the um, stuttering specifically, but uh, I think that is like you're describing the socially anxious experience, right? You're not, you just don't want to make other people awkward. You just like you're just you're not trying to be selfish. You just kind of don't like yourself, and you don't think you could perform, and you don't want others to be feeling weird. And the issue is that your self criticality is probably the only problem here, right? It's the fact that you're shitting on yourself so hard. Probably most people don't mind that you're stuttering. And to be honest, if people do mind, they're shitty. Like people who care, people who would care about that are kind of shitty people. You don't need them anyways. Right? Um, you're stuttering more because you're anxious. So a really big thing for anxiety, especially social anxiety, is to focus outward, right? If the party is the eye of Sauron, you have to look at it dead in the eye. Right? This is why I think anxious people are the people who, if they work through their anxiety, become some of the most brave people on the planet. Bravery isn't doing something when you're not afraid. It's doing something despite the fear. I really, a lot of people have complimented me, especially recently, on being brave. Um, it's a lot of feedback I get from people. It's like, man, you're so brave. Like, nothing seems to scare you. And it's like, bitch. <laughs> That's because I've lived a whole lifetime of anxiety, okay? I have tons of fear. I have just learned to find power within it. I have learned to like look at my anxiety and my anxiety response, my beating heart and my, my faster breathing, not as my body clamping down because something's about to kill me, but as it's preparing me for a battle, for preparing me to be brave. Um, that's what social anxiety is doing. When your heart is pounding in your chest, take a deep breath and realize that that heart pounding is getting more blood to your muscles, to your tongue, so that you can start to talk better. It is preparing you to do well. The most anxious people, when they get treated, become the most brave. Um, I guarantee it. And so I know it sucks, but <laughs> you can't go over it. You can't go under it. Sometimes you just got to go through it. I don't think blood will come out of your nose like an anime. No. <laughs> so there was a, um, there's an interesting study that showed actually that the, So it was a study that basically tried to look at mediating factors of decreases in anxiety for people who went through therapy. Like we're going on a bear hunt. Yes, I'm so glad somebody recognized that. Going on a bear hunt and I'm not afraid. Uh-oh, there's a swamp up ahead. I can't go over it, can't go around it, gotta go through it. Did, did, did everyone do that in preschool or whatever? So there was a really, really interesting study on all this stuff. So if you overcome socially, social anxiety, it doesn't mean you'll never be socially anxious. I will be clear, sometimes I feel super confident. I don't even feel the social anxiety, but 
I'm gonna be honest, most times like I had my 10 year high school reunion in October. Walking into the building, I felt a lot of anxiety. I was super, super nervous. So I started out with people that I knew and got kind of comfortable. And and b- to be clear, my high school reunion was my final dragon when it came to social anxiety. It was truly the monster under the bed because my social anxiety started from high school because I was bullied. I was made fun of a lot um, for being weird. And so that's what started my social anxiety is it started not by me thinking I'm weird, but by people telling me I was, right? That's how it starts for a lot of people is they get like rejected a number of times socially. So they think that they're weird. The issue is I wasn't weird. I was just at a Dutch Christian high school and everyone kind of sucked except for like the people, not everyone sucked, but a lot of these people sucked, right? I wasn't weird. They were just lame. (laughs) Like that's it. That's all that was going on. I wasn't weird. I, they were just lame and I didn't like I hadn't met my people as soon as I went to university people were like you're super cool and interesting and I people just liked me I was just I just had things to give um so let's talk about some research on psychotherapy for social anxiety disorder uh so what we see is social anxiety disorder is very very treatable um people who get treatment from therapy multiple forms of therapy about 77.9 so 78 percent of people who received treatment were doing better like six months later than those who didn't it seems to be quite effective and it's going to be more effective the more you put it into play and the more you maintain your gains right so if i get all the social anxiety treatment but then i hide myself in my house for the next two years don't be surprised that when you leave your house after covid you're going to have a little bit more social anxiety you just got to go out there got to remember everyone else is probably socially anxious too don't sweat it and put yourself and be in stressful situations and be really really brave okay in the same meta-analysis on social anxiety disorder treatment we saw that the fears of negative evaluation were we saw that the fears um so what we saw is basically fears of negative evaluation did reduce and people most markedly though people were avoiding social situations way less and reported less distress in social situations uh they also experienced less depression as well um however there was no reduction in general anxiety they basically said they weren't as afraid of negative evaluation they weren't avoiding social situations and in social situations they were less distressed overall but here's the thing about emotional distress is it's not this like it's not a simple thing. It's not just based on the size of the emotion, right? So it's not like I'm saying in therapy that we just saw the emotion decrease. There's kind of two dials to think about. And I am going to pull up my fancy little art thing again. There's two things to think about when it comes to emotional tolerance, okay? Think about it like a radio. I'm going to attempt to draw. Don't judge me. Like an old school radio. If you are a Gen Zer. This is called a boom box. Um, they used to exist. Now you're only going to get them if you're trying to be like retro fresh and cool, right? And this, these are speakers. So think about emotional regulation. Not so air- artiste Drew. I am not such an artist. Okay, there's a bunch of dials on here. Okay, buttons. So you kind of have two dials. One of them is going to be like basically the, so one of them is a dial which focuses on the size of the emotion. So one thing that you could do to help yourself feel better theoretically, right, would be to turn the size of the emotion down. That's what we think, I think a lot of times when we think about therapy, we think what we're actually doing is turning down the size of the emotion, which seems to be somewhat true. But another thing you can do is the, is you can increase your tolerance, right? So let's imagine we've got this thing, right? And we have, right? Let's say this is one, this is 10, and this is five, same thing. One, it's terrible. One, 10, and five. We have two options in therapy. We either turn down the dial in the size of the emotion or we turn up the amount of tolerance. So the big question is, what is therapy doing? Are you turning down the size of the emotion or are you turning up the tolerance? 
The answer isn't fully satisfied. Nobody's fully committed to either side. I mean, there's camps. There's some people who argue one. Aren't those the same thing? They're not the same thing. They're distinctly not the same thing. Because in the case of increased tolerance, when you get below the tolerance, the emotion that you're experiencing is the same. It just feels manageable now. Whereas in the case of the size of the emotion, and the issue as to why these are different is because if you in your head, if you're going to therapy and you're thinking, I need to feel less fear, that's probably the wrong orientation because what we actually need to do is I need to be more brave. I need to be able to tolerate more. And if you approach therapy in that way, right? The question is which approach to therapy is going to be most successful, whether you try to force the size of the emotion down, whether you try to um, turn the emotional tolerance up. And here's the big thing. Emotions are fickle. Okay. They seem to not be the most fluid things. You kind of just feel things, right? You just feel some sort of way. There isn't really a rhyme or reason. You can modulate how you feel about things with like thought challenges and stuff. But for the most part, you just kind of feel some sort of way. And I think it's in our society that shames emotions so much. I don't know if it's better to say you should feel less. What we should actually be saying is how do we get you to be more brave? It's about framing. Yes. Are emotions happening to me or do I have my hand on the emotions? So what does the data say? Well, good question. So there's an interesting study in this meta-analysis that basically showed, um, actually this one isn't in a different study. A different study showed that there was a reduction, that the reduction in anxiety experienced was mediated by a change in safety behaviors. So what we found is that people with social anxiety over rely on safety behaviors. So they're always preparing and planning and trying to basically minimize risk, try to play it as safe as possible, which makes sense. If you were afraid of something, if you think you were at risk of negative evaluation, you want to be as safe as possible, be the less, take less risk, say less things, make less jokes, right? less risky social behavior because cracking a joke and then having a flop, it's high risk behavior. Never cracking a joke means yes, you might never get the sweet, sweet pleasure of people laughing at your joke, but you're also not going to have to deal with the awful horror of it flopping, right? So what they tend to do is people with social anxiety tend to respond less to people's positive overtures, right? So if people laugh at them or they try to include them or they smile at them, Socially anxious people are way less likely to respond to these things. And they're going to remain much more emotionally regarded for self-protection, right? So if you're talking and you've got that nice, sweet girl beside you, who's also really shy and, and probably socially anxious, and she turns to you and she says, hi, and gives you like a really soft smile, you might turn back and be like, hi, and not smile because you're, you're guarded. You're not willing to lean in. You're not willing to take the risk. So. To overcome this, to stop engaging in safety behaviors, to lean into positive experiences, you have to be brave and let your guard down. To not keep yourself safe and to allow yourself to experience the negative emotion anyways, right? If you're socially anxious, you're going to try to minimize the negative experiences, which is always the anticipatory fear. It's the fear of the future. So you're going to prevent yourself from leaning into things because you don't want to risk the rejection. And the treatment is to lean into those things anyways, despite it, to be brave, to crack the joke, to be vulnerable, to smile back, to be warm to others, to let down your guards in the risk that you will be rejected, but in the hope that you will not be. That is the only way that you treat it. And just to be clear, you will be rejected sometimes. That is unavoidable. It is the, it is scary. It's, it is to this socially anxious person. You are basically saying, you're telling me to be nice, like to lean into the eye of Sauron, to the eye of Sauron looking at me and go, here I am. What do you mean? And that is precisely what I am telling you to do, which is why it is not easy. It is uncomfortable and it takes a lot of bravery. And that's why you don't have to do it every day. You can do it every week. Be like, okay, I will work on my social anxiety one day a week. And the whole rest of the week, I'm going to be building up the emotional stamina to do so. That's fine. I think what helps people overcome social anxiety is a belief that they can and a bravery to do so. The bravery and the belief are both built over time. 
but I don't think people overcome social anxiety by just not being afraid of it anymore, but by being braver than their fears, by being bigger than their fears, no longer being held back, not because it's not scary, but because they are choosing a better path forward anyways, despite it all. They're just willing to risk it. They're willing to risk it for the brisket. <laughs> Plan for the worst. Don't plan for the worst. Don't plan for the worst. Don't plan for the worst as a social anxiety. Don't plan for the worst. Hope for the best. Just, just the latter part of that. Don't plan for the worst. Hope for the best. Take your licks. Sometimes you'll fail and get up anyways. Because it's all about turning up that dial of bravery. Any questions? Anxious people generally overestimate the negative emotions. Um, especially of other people. What they do is they overestimate everyone else's negative emotions. They're like, probably everyone hates me. And you're like, most people are also self-focused and like too anxious and worried about themselves and worrying if they're cool enough or they're worrying about their own depression, that they're, they're too busy to be negatively evaluating you that much. And if they're negatively evaluating you just because like you're a little bit anxious, I don't know. I don't know. If somebody isn't going to be friends with you because you stutter a little bit when you get anxious. There's only one type of eel. I don't know if that person's worth it. Dot anxiety instead as courage. Yes. I didn't know I was anxious until I was 25. Wow. Which sucks. What sucks is the harder you try, the more people will be forced by you. More people will feel forced by you? I don't know if that's true. I've only found almost exclusively when I just tried, when I got really risky, I would crack that joke. I would lean into vulnerability. I would say, hey, and try to establish a, a conversation with somebody. Mostly what happened and the whole conversation, I just focused on the other person. I tried to pay attention to their body language, listen to their words and not fret about myself. What I found is just that the conversations went well. And they were like, wow, that was like one of the best conversations I've ever had, like in my life, like we should share numbers. Or like, man, you're like so fun to hang out with. I did this a ton at the climbing gym because it's got a really warm, friendly atmosphere anyways. I would just, my goal, every time I went to the climbing gym by myself, I was like, I'm gonna make one new friend, right? So I'd start it by being like, we'd be like looking at a mutual problem. And I'd be like, are you climbing this one? And they'd be like, yeah, I've been trying it for a couple of like days now. Like it's super hard. And be like, and I'll be like, yeah, I'm not very good. I'm just starting on threes. Like, do you want to beta me? Beta me means like walk me through how to do it. And they'll be like, I could try. And then we start baiting and I risk, I risk falling and looking like an idiot and failing the problem. And then when I fall, I'm like, damn, I'm rusty. And they're like, no, it's totally okay. I think like, you know, if you move your foot in this position or you grip it in this way, here's the thing, especially if you're just coming out of high school, high school people suck. Okay. High school is where the black pill is true. Okay. The black pill is only true in high school, which is basically People only care about you in high school if you're attractive and rich. I don't know why, but literally, if you leave high school, people stop caring about that, including the people in high school who cared only about those things. It's crazy. And the people who don't grow out of that, who just keep focusing on like looks and like wealth, unironically peak in high school. I like, I promise you, like you'll go back to your tenure. I, because I went, you're going to go back to your 10 year reunion and all the cool kids who are just, oh yeah, so cool and would exclude you because you weren't cool enough or attractive enough or whatever it was, right? Peaked in high school. There's like lame losers now. They don't matter at all. And I know it's easy to hear that and it's hard to like live it, but I like, I promise you that this is the case. I don't know why high school is so black pilled, but I promise the moment you leave high school, and you're exposed to a vast rider range of people, you start to realize nobody gives a fuck about most of this stuff. Most people are just looking for a nice conversation. That's it. <clears throat> and I'm gonna tell you right now, most of you can offer that. Is there a healthy amount of preparation? If yes, can you please give an example? I think the only time you should be doing preparation is uh, like for a party, I'm assuming you're talking like a normal social exchange, is if you actually are pretty sure that you have bad social skills. So if you are lacking social skills, I will tell you this right now, they are buildable. They are very buildable. I, one of my good friends, we were friends with him for like two years. I watched him in the two years just transform his social skills to now this motherfucker has more friends than I ever have and probably ever will have. Like everyone's just like, this person's my best friend. And I'm like, of course they are. Yeah, of course they are. Genuinely, um, 
if you think it's social skills, if you can't do the one-on-one -on -one conversations, like if you get into a one-on-one -on -one and it's still really stiff, like it is a social skills issue and social anxiety, you got to work on your social skills. I would highly recommend uh, books like Never Split the Difference and How to Win Friends and Influence People. Learn the social skills and techniques to just like start building warm regard and just practice them methodically. Like just go up to a random new person in your study class or like out in the gym or whatever and just practice mirroring over and over and it's going to be awful at first but you just got to keep practicing it and practicing it and getting better so if it's an actual social skills issue you need to improve the social skills there is a lot of books out there that are great for that if it is not social skills if it is just social anxiety i'm gonna go back to your question make sure i answer it properly beep, 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 beep. where are you healthy amount of preparation. Beyond that, I don't think you should really prepare other than sometimes it's not a bad idea. I know a couple of people that have like, I know a couple of engineers that have this. I think engineers get like pamphlets about social skills. It's good to have like a couple of like preparatory questions that are easy to ask if you like get stuck so that you like know you have like some interesting questions in your back pocket. So you can definitely prep some of those. I would actually watch interviewers for this. Um, so you know that guy who does like the flame and hot wings stuff? He has really interesting questions that he asks people. People really like being asked interesting, unique questions because it's compelling and people like to talk about themselves. So like when in doubt, ask the other person about themselves. That's the easiest way to make conversation. If you ask a person about themselves, they'll talk to you for like two hours straight, almost always. There's a couple of people who are like, you're asking so much about me. That's very weird and I'm paranoid, but like, I'll be honest, like that's their stuff, not yours. Like most people just like, especially if you just ask and you converse. Like, so if they answer the question, don't just ask another one, respond a little bit about it. And then when the conversation dries up a little bit, ask another question. Super, super There's easy. There's only one type of veal. Okay. Dot hi kids. <laughs> hi headless. And basically thank you for the subs. Okay. So what to do practically. So I'm gonna give you some acute techniques for social anxiety and then some longer form. So some really acute techniques. Bilateral stimulation or the butterfly technique. This is a grounding technique. I've already taught you it. I haven't taught you it for anxiety. I'm gonna cover a couple of them. Right before you walk in, unironically, like if you're going to a party, go to the bathroom if your anxiety is getting super high to the point where you're like, I can't fucking cope and do some grounding techniques in the bathroom. Just excuse yourself. People won't notice. Even if you're in there for like 10 minutes, people aren't really going to notice. And even if they do, the worst that they'll think is that you took a shit. Like everyone shits. Surprise. This is called the butterfly technique um, or bilateral stimulation. It's just tapping yourself on both sides. Usually I pair this with breathing. We're not really sure why. Uh, EMDR utilizes uh, bilateral stimulation as well. Something about this is very soothing to us and it allows us to basically like come down and kind of somewhat like it, almost like observe our emotions, but not in a dis like kind of in a dissociated way, but in a much like healthier way. So bilateral stimulation can be really good at kind of regulating yourself down. Um, and over time, as you regulate yourself down, you also are turning up the, the notch of your tolerance because you realize I can go up in my anxiety and I can bring myself back down, which gives your brain the knowledge of even if I'm getting really high in my anxiety, I can still manage it, which is where the tolerance comes from. <clears throat> Is it bad to lean on drinking to help with social anxiety? I would say yes. I think if you're leaning on drinking all the time, like if it is your go-to self-medication, you're just creating a risk, a situation for addiction. Like it's just, you're putting yourself at high risk for it. And I would argue there's just no, there's no good reason to it. It's, it's gonna be a long con problem. I think you will always have to socially interact. There's no end. You might be like, well, once I get a wife, it'll be fine. It's like, yeah, but then you still have to make friends at work and you still have to make friends like, like at your hobbies and stuff. So excuse me, I have to go poop. Yeah, say it like that too. Um, so butterfly technique, pair this with breathing. You can also do this while doing three, two, one. So three, two, one, like I said before, it's a grounding technique. Three things you see, two things you hear, one thing you feel. I pair it with breathing. You can also pair it with bilateral. You can also pair it with bilateral and breathing and doing three, two, one. Ha, oh, three in ones. Um, three things you see, cup, you know, toilet, mirror. Uh, two things you hear, 
the part the voice of the party years outside maybe you'll hear like the the tack of like a ball on the ping pong table right one thing you feel try to notice sensations on your body you know can you and try to notice unique sensations that you've kind of um habituated to can you focus long enough to start feeling like the choker on your neck uh, i wear this all the time i have a hard time feeling it unless i move it so i'd have to move it and then i can feel it again can you feel the cuffs on your sleeves i'm wearing a ring can i feel the ring on my finger can you feel like your tongue pressed against your teeth right start noticing all of these cues can i feel the pressure of the earpiece kind of on my ear can i feel that it's filling my eardrum a little bit can i feel like the sensation of that that is going to be your acute process so if you're in the middle of a party and you're trying to work on your social anxiety and you're maxing out but you still don't want to leave get some space to yourself go to the bathroom that's the easiest way to do it and do bilateral stimulation a three two one or some sort of like mindful breathing technique <clears throat> um there's tons of them you can do mindful breathing that's just like um like you picture basically like you close your eyes and you picture like a flashlight and you shine the flashlight on different parts of your body and as you're doing that you're pairing it with breathing and you're thinking about directing your breath into that body part so it's like a very intentive mindfulness activity there's all sorts of them i i could give you some literally if you just google mindfulness breathing techniques you're gonna find tons of them you just gotta find one that you like thank you based on All right. Oh, my neck is so sore. Another thing you can do for your anxiety, pay attention to others more. If you're noticing that you're starting to think about your body, your face, you're starting to focus on yourself in the midst of a conversation, notice that and go, good job. I noticed that I'm being, I'm focusing on myself more than the other. And then refocus on them. Notice their body language. What are they saying? Really listen closely to what they're saying. Just focus exclusively on the other person. <clears throat> it's incredibly hard to be self-critical when you're not thinking about yourself and when you're focused on other people. I think one of the best things you can do, at least for me, is just get out of my own head. I love like psychoanalytic introspective work, but it wasn't very helpful for me when it came to social anxiety because I would introspect in turn inside so much that it was actually just making my social anxiety worse i just need to basically be like you know what fuck it let's just talk to this person and let's see if i can find like three interesting facts about them stupid game but let's try it and i would just ask them questions and i don't want boring shit i don't want to know like that they're a blue man and they work at like a, a blue person job i want to be like what's a weird food that you've tried before right i want to i want to hear like a unique story that i imagine they don't just tell every random stranger so pay attention to others you know as he's telling the story this very boring kind of like normal small talky story about his week i noticed that he like paused a little bit while he was mentioning um like his dog uh i should ask about his dog <clears throat> so they'd be like do you, that, do you have a dog and he'd be like yeah I'd be like oh tell me about your dog I'm like oh well like my dog's getting older and like blah 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 and maybe it'll like turn like a little sad like yeah my dog's getting older i'm just like worried about him you know he's just not keeping up with me like i used to and be like oh that's super tough to hear how long have you had your dog oh i've had my dog for like 12 years blah blah, blah. see super easy to build a conversation very very easy it's, it's very natural you just got to pay attention to the other person if you're watching another person they will give you infinite amount of information to give you feedback unless they're also social anxious and giving you like one word responses and then you can either try to pull it out of them, but if you're trying to work on your own social anxiety, find somebody who gives you more conversation options. It's not always you. Sometimes it's them. And finally, expose yourself to lots of different situations. That is one of the uh, most recommended things in social anxiety treatment is just exposure, exposure, exposure. So start with things that you can tolerate and build your way up to things that seem more stressful so that you can get just exposed to a shitload of stuff so start by going to like your favorite hobby but maybe try new hobbies maybe go to a dance club maybe go to a bar all right finally for social anxiety so i did a research on something called incremental mindsets so there are mindsets that we have about ourselves and we can basically art believe that something is changeable or not if we believe it to be changeable that is called an incremental mindset or a growth mindset growth mindsets are 
fundamental mindsets to even make therapy work. So if you go into therapy and you don't believe that it will work or that this, your social anxiety can improve, it is likely to not improve. It is one, it is a powerful mediating factor to therapy efficacy is just believing that you can change it, that there is hope, right? Anxiety isn't some sissy response. It's reasonable. It's built into our systems. And historically, our anxiety system has allowed us to rise to dominance as like having fucking, there's 8 billion humans on the planet and only 4,000 elephants. And I think there'd be a lot more elephants if they were a little bit more anxious. I'm not going to lie, okay? Anxiety has deep, powerful purposes. It's not bad. The problem is that sometimes anxiety gets out of control, right? But you can change it. There is hope. Anxiety is an incredibly flexible thing. Even if you have high, high levels of anxiety, there are techniques that you can utilize and mindsets that you can grow that help you to manage your anxiety better and to be braver than you think you are. I promise you that if you have a high level of anxiety, you are braver than you know you are. I know it's scary, but not being fearful isn't what makes you brave. It's moving through the fear that does. If you believe that your anxiety, especially your social anxiety can change, that will be one of the most critical things that allows you to change it. It just will. And yeah, that's that. Thanks for coming to my talk. <laughs> How do you actually give a shit though? Enough to change it? Um, picture your life if you didn't have social anxiety. Do you want that life? Then chase it. What if you're content with your anxiety and simply don't want to be around people? I don't know if I believe you. I think the idea that somebody is content with their anxiety is necessarily antithetical to what anxiety is, right? If you've made peace with your anxiety, I would say, sure, you can do that. You don't have to change your anxiety. However, I think life improves for people who do. But you don't have to. If you don't want to change anything, then don't. I'm not saying you must. I hate people, so believe me. That just makes me sad though, Kit, because there's so many good people out there too. There's some really, really wonderful people that you're missing out on. You are probably missing out on some of the best joys, but you can do. If that's what you choose for yourself, you can do that. But like hurt, <laughs> yes. When you fall, do you just get back up or even if you keep falling? I never met one, but thanks. Okay. That's sad. I'm sorry to hear that. That sounds like a pretty sad life, but I hope you have lots of pets or plants to make you happy instead. Is it more about the methods learned or the actual therapist? Uh, it's going to be... Mm, for social anxiety specifically, it's a bit about the methods, but anyone can teach you the methods. It's going to be with therapy specifically, it's more about the relationship that you have with your therapist. Because if you have a really good relationship with your therapist, they can teach you these methods. They're pretty simple. Most therapists know that the stuff that I'm talking to you about, like none of this is like, I'm not exactly breaking the book. Uh, I haven't come up with anything. This is all data, all researched, very well established science. Um, Therapeutic rapport and empathy and stuff, common factors to therapy seem to be some of the most important. Obviously, unless you're with a therapist who's like, don't expose yourself to more things. Don't try to get rid of your anxiety. You know, it's good. For you. Accept it. Um, that would be the only therapist I would say is probably not good for you. Any tips for pushing through the fear and starting the steps to overcome social anxiety? I would say pick a goal that you really, really want. I don't know what it is, but for me, my goal was I don't want to be so miserably lonely and depressed that I want to kill myself. That was my goal, <laughs> basically. Unironically, I was like, this is a problem. I don't really want to kill myself because I didn't really want to be dead. I just didn't want to have to bear the pain anymore. And so I said, I want relationship. And I want relationship more than I want to hide from my fears. And so... I think you just have to find that thing, like whatever it is, um, that dream. It, it's fun. It's like, it's the belief in, it's, a, it's like, it's as lame and as narrative and as like standard Disney book as I could possibly offer. But it is like, what is the dream? Um, you know, my dream, I remember every single night falling asleep, wishing I really wanted a partner. I wanted to fall asleep with somebody 
like spooning me. That was every night I went to sleep and I would picture in my head the idea of somebody just spooning me, somebody who loves me. And I have it now. Um, I'm not saying that like, I'm not trying to say like manifestation. I'm not trying to do like the secret shit. I think the dream stuff is just step one. It's just to have something that you want enough that you want it more than you fear the anxiety. That's it. And for me, it was like, I want to have connection. I want to feel loved. Um, I want to have people in my life. And that was it. And that was enough to basically be like, and if I want people, I have to get over this. I have to go out there. Any more questions? That's me every single day. Nice. Existence is pain. <laughs> yeah, sometimes life sucks and then you, sometimes life sucks and then you die. Sometimes life sucks and then you keep living. But yeah. I want to be not sick. I feel that. You obviously know what crooked is, so don't let it affect your mental health. She doesn't like this stream. I see you. I look at both. Hey, Erudite, I'm in high school and I sort of fit in with the pretty crowd and I have some social anxiety, but I can limit it to where I just feel like I'm not able to fully express myself. Solutions? Tricky. Um, it depends on what you mean by fully express yourself. Like, are there parts of you that you are like, like, it's like, do you, do you love anime, but you're like too afraid to tell your cool friends because they'll think you're weird if you like tell them that you have anime? That's tricky. Um, if they're actually a true friend, they're going to be somebody who's fine with that. Um... High school is really tricky though. Like people in high school suck, man. Like they just, it's rough. Um, so the main thing I would say is, do you have some of those friends that you can be full of yourself with? Or if you don't, are there people in your life that you're friends with that you think you probably could be full of yourself with? And also what does fully myself mean? Like what does that, what do you, what do you think that you're hiding from them? After about five years of blue collar customer service, I'm pretty good at turning small talk into deeper talks. Yeah. Real friends stop you from watching anime. <laughs> how do you, how do people meet each other other than rock climbing? Ah, you got me. That's my go-to. Um, good question. Okay. How do you meet people other than rock climbing? Hobbies are the best way to meet people. Hobbies, hobbies, hobbies. Or volunteering. Volunteering is another really good way um, to meet people. So looking for anything that's kind of community oriented, where there's going to be a lot of capacity for kind of like free flow, but semi-structured interactions with other people, right? So when you join like a volunteering thing, volunteering can be good, assuming that you're allowed to interact with other people in like a free flow way, right? So like volunteering where you're serving food can sometimes not be the best way to meet people, but volunteering like dog walking can be amazing. Like if you volunteer at like the SPCA, you get trained with a whole bunch of people, you get puppies. It's a super easy middleman conversation because we all know anyone who's worked with animals extensively, you just personify them. Every puppy has a personality and like, right? Like Brandy, the like super cool Cocker Spaniel is like, she's onto like some hot girl shit. And she's always, she's always got hot girl summer going on, right? And all the boys love her. And you can just like start personifying these animals. I, every animal person does this. I've worked with horse people enough to know that we have just turned the entire horse herd into fucking the nerd guys and the jocks and the hot girls and the, and the like fuck boys and stuff like that. Um, school is an okay way, but particularly if you go to school, joining either, if you're in programs that require like large amount of group work to some extent, it can be a great way to meet people or it can make you hate people. Um, but community clubs can be really beneficial. Um, I really enjoy joining like improv drama oriented hobby, hobby activities as well, because they necessarily are interacting. So the more where it necessitates interaction, the better, um, cause it'll kind of facilitate and force conversation. Um, which is why like drama troops and improv clubs and stuff like that can be really good because you're acting, you literally have to interact. You can't not, um, yeah. How the fuck do you personify a horse? They all act the same. Oh no, 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 they do not. You just don't know horses. How do I get people to be generally interested in me? I feel like my conversations always end up being about them, but they never try to reciprocate and ask more about me. So that's a really good question. Um, how do I get people to be generally more interested in me? So p there's a bunch of different ways. Number one, you might just be befriending shitty people. Um, 
or an- not even shitty people. Sometimes it's just anxious people. Like they don't know how to ask you questions. So one way you can do that is to kind of bridge people into your own world. So say you ask them a question about like um, their parents and they tell you a bit about them. And maybe there's something about what they say that you relate to. Like maybe you're like, oh, hashtag I have mommy issues too, right? The best way you can do that is by them saying, say they're like, yeah, like this is my relationship with my dad. I'm pretty close. It works out. But like me and my mom, like things are really tense and weird. I don't know. It just like never works out too. Then what you can say is like, oh, crazy. I have some mommy issues too. Like what was your life like growing up with her? They're probably going to tell you for a little bit as well. Hopefully by that point, since you said me too, hopefully they'll toss the ball back if they don't though sometimes people just drop the ball and you can still catch it and pick it up right so say they like tell you a fair bit about your mom you can their mom a little bit and they're like yeah my mom was just like she was always busy and working and like my dad was kind of the one like more involved with the kids and my mom was like she would come home from work and just be kind of grouchy she didn't ever want to like hang out with us when we like went to the beach and stuff my dad would always be the one like organizing activities and my mom would just be like grumpy and reading a book she just like never seemed to want to interact with us and be like oh man that's crazy like um I can like really understand and keep on like bringing someone to like bring it back to you, like relating to some degree. Most people pick up at some point to toss the ball at some point, right? Um, another way is you can start a conversation by telling interesting stories about yourself, right? So like maybe you two are conversing about cars and they're telling you a bit about like their interest in cars. And then like, okay, that's interesting. Oh my gosh, I have this crazy story about a car. And then tell them whatever crazy story you have about the car. So you've told them a whole bunch about themselves. Most people will, again, most people will toss ball a bit and be like, oh, that's so interesting. Especially if your story is told kind of interesting and you act it out a little bit and use interesting voices and stuff. Um, just try to make it not too long because that's really annoying when people monologue, right? But just bring them into your world by telling them about yourselves or by basically if they drop the ball, by picking it up. So if they like talk about like their dog and stuff, they're like, oh, crazy, I have a dog too. And if you leave it there, most normal people will go, oh, really? What kind of breed is your dog? Or how old is, they'll usually ask you a question. Oh, yeah? What about your dog? And then you'll tell them, right? If you've gone and you've offered them the ball and picked up the ball a bunch of times and they never ever toss it back, there's either, you have two options now. You can confront them on it if you're like, if you feel like you're good enough friends that you wanna confront them and it's worth the friendship or that might be a cue that that friendship is just like not for you. Um, It's kind of up to you at that point. You can just like walk away. Yeah, good question. Thanks for the question. Um, no, I don't do that because then it feels like you're trying to one up their trauma. No, not usually. Um, the only time it's going to feel like if you're trying to one up their trauma is if you're constantly doing it, right? So if they say like, yeah, like, you know, I've got a lot of health problems be like, me too. And then they're like, yeah, mine are this. And you're like always jumping in. But if they're, if you've been spending a two hour conversation asking them about themselves and they've never asked it back. If you say, if you relate on one thing, they're not going to say that you're trauma dumping on them or trying to one up them. And if they are, I'm sorry, but the fucking audacity that if somebody has spent two hours with you only asking about you and you've only talked about yourself and then at one point they also share back something about themselves, if that person has the fucking audacity to be like, oh, they're just one upping me, literally no. That, that like boundary right there. That is not how people approach relationships. That is so ridiculous. I would just walk away. Like, fuck that shit. Like, no, that's ridiculous. People are gonna think you're one upping their trauma if you're constantly trying to one up their trauma, which means in a two hour conversation, you ask them about their selves and then you tell them about yourselves immediately, always, and you constantly redirect it back to you. That's where people are gonna get annoyed, reasonable people, because you are kind of making about yourself. Probably because a large portion of where you find your personality and your identity is in your trauma and your problems. So all you know about what to talk about is your issues. But you're expecting people to act how you would. Truth is people act how they want if you try to expect stuff from people that only frustrates them. Uh, I don't think that's totally true. I think people like rise to the expectations we give them. I think have reasonable expectations, right? But when I'm building a friendship with somebody, there's an inherent expectation that it's gonna be somewhat tit for tat. Like if I'm gonna spend a fair bit of time talking about them, I've never had a friendship where they don't go, we've been talking about me for like an hour and a half. Do you wanna talk about you? 
all of my friends do that, right? And probably to some degree because I've selected for that because I'm really interested in investing in the people that I love. But to, at some point, I expect in return. Now, obviously, if my friend's mom got murdered yesterday, I don't expect the conversation to be about me for a couple of weeks at least, right? But to some degree, I think it's reasonable to expect this like give and exchange. Right question to ask when looking for a long-term relationship. Oh man. <laughs> um, probably at some point, are you looking for a long-term relationship or like what are your relationship goals? I think that's probably the most important if you're looking for a long-term relationship. I've been on the opposite end where I don't want people to talk about me. I wonder why. Probably because you feel like guarded, I would guess. Like most people who don't want people to talk about them are people who feel like a need to be very guarded. And obviously like the like psych part of me cues in and goes, why? Like, why are you so guarded? But that's for you to figure out. Will it be easier to foster these relationships when I am older? Yes, um, to an extent, especially like 19 to 25 is where most people form most of their lifelong relationships. Not exclusively, because you can still make friends after that age, obviously, but a lot of your most formative relationships will be formed outside of high school. There's not, so some people have, like I'm really lucky in that I have a lot of friends still from high school. So I was bullied pretty badly in high school, but I also have, um, I'd say, two really close friendships from high school. Like my best friend to this day is a girl from high school. Um, but a lot of people leave high school and never look back. <laughs> so it's a bit of both. Refusal to communicate or cooperate. What if you're getting stonewalled in the conversations like an IRL meet? I think if somebody's like really actually stonewalling you all the time, especially if they're like a random, like somebody you're just trying to build a friendship with, like you don't know them well. Honestly, a stonewall is kind of a cue of like, leave me the fuck alone. I would usually take the cue and leave them alone. Now, obviously, if you're saying stonewalled by like a very, very, very close friend, that's different. I would ask, why are you, I wouldn't say stonewalling because stonewalling is a bit of a big word, right? I wouldn't be like, why are you a narcissist? But I would be like, why are you, sh like it's, I would say like, hey, I've been feeling like um, communicating with you has been really hard. Like you've been like, shutting down and kind of giving like one word answers and just like, it doesn't feel like you're super open to talking with me. I'm just wondering if something's going on. That's how I would open it if it was like a close personal friend. Yeah, both, okay. Sorry, I blurred your chat thing takes a couple of seconds to load in for me. I hope that answered your question. Feel free to post again if you need, if you need to explain it more. <clears throat> if they're actually stonewalling you call them out for it ask them what their deal is unless they're a stranger like if you don't know them very well like if you've met them twice i wouldn't call them out i would just leave them all they might be stonewalling you because they don't know you very well but they're like super stressed and upset and they just don't want to talk to anyone that day like i don't know i give people the benefit of the doubt right like if it's a random stranger i probably would just leave them alone if it's like somebody i'm building a kind of friendship with and it's been like three times in a row i might ask them about it at some point um it's really going to depend on context and the closeness of your relationship <clears throat> and the reality is like somebody might like stonewall you one day and be open to chatting another day um like people people get in their feelings right and half the time it's not about you. Like half the time when somebody stonewalls you is because they're like mad at their boss from like two hours ago or they had a fight with their mom on their way to like the club or something like that. I would call out strangers for stonewalling. I'm a bit obnoxious. The problem is that if you call, here's the thing. If you call out a stranger for stonewalling like the first time they do it to them, all that's gonna happen is they're gonna resent you for it and you might ruin a potentially like good friendship like maybe they were stonewalling you for a completely reasonable reason which is like they were super upset and distressed because like what if their mom fucking died like two weeks ago or like that day not two weeks ago what if their mom died recently and they're like stonewalling you because they're just like super shut down and sad and then it's like if you just like call them on it they're gonna be like what the fuck dude like if they're like if you're like why are you being so like you're just like stonewalling me and like not talking like don't you realize that if you want people to talk to you you should communicate back to them and they'll like look at you and they'll be like my mom fucking died i'm just not really in the mood right now you look like the asshole so like that's why i, I tend to see people with a margin of error like give them three chances if they're still stonewalling you like three three interactions like later so like that full day is one interaction say like you meet them you see them every week and every single week after that they're always cold towards you that might be worth calling out but also in a group 
I still probably wouldn't because like they're just not worth it like if I barely know you and you've just decided you dislike me like okay get like whatever get fucked I'll just go be friends with other people like it's not a big deal I don't know how do you act with uh English second language folk who can't articulate uh well and is made worse by anxiety um usually so I've been finding so I used to nanny for a Vietnamese woman um, who had pretty broken English and pretty high anxiety and she would get really really embarrassed when she couldn't communicate well um, mostly what I try to do when I, I try to be nice right so I'm willing to carry people's emotions a little bit so if I notice that I'm talking to somebody and they seem really really anxious um, I'm willing to like very gently like try to give them like calming cues right so if it, if it was an ESL person um, and they're like struggling with words I might make a joke of being like, man, like, don't worry. I imagine you could like, you could talk me left, right, and center if you were talking to Vietnamese. Like, it's totally okay. Like, you just don't know the language well, right? So I'll try to like abate their fears of basically saying like, a lot of ESL people are worried that people will think they're stupid because a lot of idiots unironically just treat ESL people like they're stupid because they don't speak English clearly. And it's like, brah, if you only speak one language, you don't have anything to stand on, okay? If they can speak one language fluently, most of these... First of all, mostly is how people speak like three to four languages fluently. If they can speak one fluently and they're trying on a second, it doesn't mean they're, they, that actually is a marker that they're probably more intelligent. Like, what the fuck are you doing? So I try to usually like let ESL people know that like, I totally understand that they're ESL. I don't think that they're stupid. It's, they're doing an amazing job. Um, often I'll make like a couple of like self-derisive comments of being like, yeah, don't worry. Like I've been, I was born and raised in Canada and I still could barely, like I, I still don't know what most like words mean. Something like that if I have better rapport with them and I know that they would appreciate that joke. Um, I try to like abate people's fears. If I notice people are really anxious when they're talking to me, I usually will go out of my way to like abate their fears. If I like, but that takes a bit of mind reading too, right? Like I basically have to read them see that they're feeling anxious and kind of guess the reason why and then address it um so you can do that if you want to uh, i think it is nice to do that it's not bad to not do that i would never tell somebody they need to talk to me in order to have a better life i would say hey why are you so cold towards me that's fair I just find I like to give people a bit of margin of error. Like if somebody's cold one day, I probably wouldn't call it out. If they're a complete stranger, they don't owe me anything like at all. The issue is like when you're calling somebody out on a behavior, when you're confronting them on something, there's an expectation back there as well, which is, hey, why are you doing this thing that I expect? Why are you either not doing a thing that I expect you to do or why are you failing at something, right? <clears throat> call out rude strangers. Please don't. You just make the world a worse place and it doesn't help for the most part i mean you can't okay you can it's neutral it's neutral you want to call out rude strangers go for it just realize like all you're doing is making yourself feel better which you could do just don't moralize it the worst part to me is when people will be like i'm kind of rude to strangers when they're rude to me and i'm like i can understand that and they're like because i'm teaching them a lesson and i'm like no you're not you're just making them hate strangers more like that's it <laughs> you can do it but it's not a moral thing that you're doing. Is it even bad for them to be cold? It's a stranger. Well, again, it depends on the context, right? Like, what if you are have been in a club for two to three weeks? You've worked with this person on a couple of like projects or something like that. They've interacted with you normally up until this point, and then suddenly they switch to being really cold. And especially, what if in this context they're cold towards you and they're nice towards everyone else, right? That feels weird. That's kind of icky. And especially like say you're in a group project and you have to like work with them for a couple of more weeks you might choose to confront them and be like hey like is there something that i've done that offended you like um and they'd be like no why and they'd be like oh it just seems like you like interact with me a little bit differently now here's the thing if you're going to confront them you better have examples prepped because they're always going to ask can you give me an example <laughs> That's what everyone does. So you better say, yeah, like the other day when we were working in the group project, you were talking really nicely with Jimmy uh, and you offered him stuff. And then when I, I asked you a question, you kind of looked at me, you didn't answer and you rolled your eyes. And then when I asked again, you kind of said, uh, no, right? And they can be like, oh, well, yeah, I didn't do that. It's good to have examples. That's why I like to give people three, uh, margin of error three. If they fuck up three times in a row, well, now I have three examples.
So that if I'm like, hey, you're being kind of cold towards me, and they go, what do you mean? No, I'm not. I'll be like, well, I have this example, and they'll cope about it. And then I'll be like, yeah, but I also have this second example. And they usually won't cope, but some of them will still cope, but it'll be weaker. And they're like, that's fair. But then this third example happened. And then they're like, well, yeah, it's really hard to run away from three examples of you doing a shitty thing. <clears throat> Everyone knows escalation is the best way to get aggressive people to change their behavior. Wow, big true. Uh, rude infants. <laughs> rude infants. <laughs> <laughs>